Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harp here and I'm back with my good friend Tim Partridge. How are you doing Tim? I'm good, thank you Oliver. How are you? I'm very well and today we are discussing uh, maybe one of the weaker sequels of our youth, do you think? Um, yeah, although it has many uh, plus points, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's got a lot of good points, um, but some areas which uh, people weren't particularly happy with when it came out. But we'll discuss those as we progress through the commentary. And it's, of course, on Ghostbusters 2. Uh, so if you wish to sync the commentary with your own copy of the film, put the timestamp to zero and press play now. Now, Tim, did you did you see us at the cinema? Were you, you were old enough, weren't you? But... Or did you wait for it to come out on video? No, I didn't see this at the cinema. I saw it, uh, I think, on television when it premiered. My God, oh, right. Okay, that's probably a couple of years after then, really. Probably early, what, 92, something like that? It must have been, maybe 93 in this country. I just wanted to say about this opening, um, just so I don't forget. Um, it starts off, like the first film in many ways, at the pre-title sequence for the Ghostbusters film. I think this is kind of a rule of the franchise. Um, it's, there's no humour at all mm. in this opening yeah. it's a little bit campy here because they're setting up the whole everyone's negative thing yeah here's a little bit of, but but it's minor and you don't really i certainly didn't pick up as i didn't even pick up on it as it's, a kid watching it's got it. more sort of cheerful music isn't it sort of playful yeah and it doesn't melody. have well uh elmer bernstein isn't no, on this film sadly not and you get this uh well it's from randy edelman who at that time you know was known for the macgyver theme tune this was kind of his big break oh god yeah he'd just he... done twins for um ivan reitman and um, then he went to work with rob cohen didn't he a lot i think the dragon heart yeah and, and, and like that. before that he'd been a kind of um uh, you know, pit, Broadway pit orchestra mm. uh, player in the 70s. And he'd done, there's a Barry Manilow song called uh, Weekend in New England. Mm. And uh, he'd written that originally. And so he was from that that kind of background. So he's like a, you know, he's using sort of keyboard and, and synthesizers in a way that I think kind of become a bit normal now. Yeah, well, definitely. And also because of his approach to scoring this with his sort of keyboards and stuff, it, there are little 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 cues of music that kind of do harken, to, harken back to the cartoon, which was popular, very popular at the time. Yeah. Um, I'd like this intro, I, cause it's all physical effects. It's all, you know, there's no opticals whatsoever. Mm. Um, as a kid, I never saw these films as, as comedies as a kid because you, I just didn't get it, you know, because I was tiny and also because the TV show was done straight. But, you know, when I first saw the sequence, I just picture in my mind the ghoul pushing, yeah. you know, and you think it's a dead old person or whatever, <laughs> you know, um, because, you know, you're, you're that age. Um, and it's, yeah, it's generally ter terrifying. You don't know what, this, the, what the threat is in this. Look at that shot. It's amazing. That's a good, straight that's down a good the street. that is, yeah. And the terror of the bus. He's really good, Ivan Reitman, at the, constructing these suspense sequences. Yeah. I think we discussed in the first one that he's, Ivan's so good at capturing New York sort of on, on film, you know, the spirit of it as well. Yeah. I think this is the only time I used a theme, isn't it, in the film? The classic Ray Parker Jr. Yes. Theme. Was it right at the end a little bit? Yes, yes a little correct, bit yeah. yeah, when the paintings revealed. But also they have this, uh, you know, this was kind of the beginning of the films where they would take an old theme and then they'd remix it, you yeah. know, and that's with um, Run DMC, isn't it? Yes, right. Yeah. That was like, yeah, then Bobby Brown as well. And this is a Christmas, this is a New Year's set film, Ghostbusters yeah. 2. So the, uh, the environment, I think it's more of a, I don't know, it's just sort of fall, autumn that's in the right. first because film. Because it's, it's oh, oh, you know. Uh, she's a, a what is that, familiar face of Richard Donner's movies, uh, Goonies and Lethal Weapon. She plays a psychiatrist for to oh, okay. Martin Riggs in Lethal Weapon 1 to 4. And she's in Die Hard as, uh, what was she? She's sort of a news presenter. Right. Um, she sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and this rude child here who says the Ghostbusters are full of crap. As of right now, he's directing Ghostbusters, the, the new Ghostbusters <laughs> sequel, <laughs> which is... Interesting. Because <laughs> he, you know, I, 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 well, people have actually quizzed me and um, what I thought about the, uh, with uh, Jason Reitman directing. I, I thought, I, I like his other movies. I think he'd be quite a good choice because out of all the directors that probably could have been chosen, he's probably the, the closest to Ghostbusters than anyone, I think, really. Yeah, yeah. 
I was going to say we're starting. I mean, they, you, you, we, we get this reveal here where you think, you know, we you think it sets the sequence up that you think the Ghostbusters are going to go to a mission. They're going to, yeah. you know, it's going to be it's going to be business as normal. Um, but um, I mean, what people what we forget is it was a self-contained film, the first film, mm. and and now they've, you know, we're show well in here they've had it, so things have had gone wrong mm. in the in the in the aftermath. Well, they got they got they got the, a massive bill to pay, didn't they? Which yeah. they're basically bankrupt. And now they're having to do birthday parties, which is a big, uh, you know, a popular thing at the time. I, I think we also, we saw it where the kids were basically, they didn't want the Ghostbusters, they wanted He-Man. But in 89, He-Man was no longer popular. The the, 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 the the toy range had really dropped off months before even the He-Man movie came out. So 89, I think it would have been really Ninja Turtles the kids would have been crazy for. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, just in terms of the meaning, you know, the film and its message and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Oh, so Gwenny Weaver entering frame now. Um, kind of with the first film, it was very much about business. And I think sort of in the last few years, um, it, was, it was inherently politicized just with the inclusion of the EPA, of having that minor villain character yeah. playing the EPA, you know, who are regulating the, you know, the frankly irresponsible and adolescent <laughs> Ghostbusters. But, you know, in recent years, Ivan Reitman has, has sort of said, you know, that he was trying deliberately trying to put a libertarian message into it um, about too much government regulation. And, you know, I, I personally, I, I just think that the whole film, um, you know, it makes fun of everyone. It's celebrating the absurdity of, of being a, a living human. I don't see the kind of you know the political siding but um with this film they've said actually i think it was in the blu-ray interviews dan Aykroyd and ivan reitman um that um they'd felt at the time that of you know development of ghostbusters 2 that new there'd been sort of a meanness in new york they'd felt people being mean to each other and and um they bad um, attitude going down yeah and they wanted to kind of they were just kind of feeling that on the streets so it's coming from this kind of weird social basis and I I think it's interesting the film has this kind of message throughout of not holding on to bad feelings of the past and you know and looking forwards and you see that I think uh, well chiefly you see it with um, the setting New Year's Eve you know and especially as this this is set in 1989 going into 1990 even though it was filmed in the winter of 1988 yeah um, so it's the you know how much more of a clean slate can you get you know a mm. clean canvas to start your life and I think you know the painting mm. you know itself I mean not to give any spoilers but at the end of the film the painting itself gets wiped out it's trying to continue this kind of negative kind of negative feelings of bitterness of being you know this dictator being mm. this Carpathian sorcerer being cut up all those years mutilated all those years ago and he's coming back and he's going to get his yeah. you know I'm going to come he's back built, he's built off because his strength is accumulated due to the negativity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, brought, that's what's brought him back. But at the end of the film, they wipe, they literally wipe the canvas clean wipe and start clean. a new yeah. one, you know. And this film really, for me too, as I say, because the first film was really so business-orientated, this is really... Uh, and, and it's also the first film, even though it's called Ghostbusters, two-thirds of the way in, the Ghostbusters, we realise they're red herrings. It's actually this kind of God thing, you know, that they're, it's, you know, it, it, a portal's been opened that the ghosts are coming out of, but it's not the ghosts, it's, it's Gozer and it's Ivo Shandor and it's mm. and it's and it, it isn't what it says it is on the tin you know no, no. you know whereas this film for me I feel sp- spiritually it's mm. it's really a film about ghosts and m- not just literal but ghosts memories of i mean you see a lot of the ghosts we see them later as well um where they are you know they're dead people and they're people who people know you know yeah um which is they don't do in the first one although as a kid watching it you you know, sometimes you just, you just kind of subtly think it all kind of fits in you know, there naturally yeah, yeah, within yeah. the Ghostbusters universe. Yeah, but here as well, you've got. I mean, Venkman is living with this ghost of you know his relationship with um, Diane. Yeah, you know, and um, we've we've and also um, just this. This, you know, the, the, everything hanging over the the events of the first film and how things didn't work out, and they've got all these things that are following around them that they all have to kind of look up, to, you know, look look in the eye and sort of say, you know, what, I'm going to take this forward, and there's, mm. you know, that happens as it, you know, as it goes. And um, yeah, so I really like the fact that it's kind of a film more about ghosts, and of course, the, the villain is, is is actually a ghost. I, but the the idea of the ghost haunting a painting, I thought was quite a novel idea. I thought that was quite interesting because they couldn't do, even though, because this film was criticised, wasn't it, for essentially repeating the first one. 
And that's what generally sequels were. That's what they always did was give people something familiar, but something with a slightly new twist. Um, if it was, if the sequel was radically different, I think people would probably be upset because saying, "Oh, why isn't it like the first one?" Yeah. Um, but uh, over time, I think the sequel has gained more fans. At the time, it, it was panned by critics and Siskel and Ebert. So it was the worst film, well, one of the worst films of 1989. Um, but that was a year of sequels, and uh, I think most film critics were getting sick of them by that point. Where now it's so commonplace, but we still we still highlight that though. We still complain that there's not another fucking sequel, mm. you know. Um, but you're right; the painting is absolutely iconic. Mm. By the way, this is Chloe Webb who played uh, Nancy Spungen in Sid and Nancy, and she was also in Twins, which Ivan Reitman had done the year before this mm. too. I mean, this film had, I think, from what I gather, it kind of it was made quite quickly, you know. I, back, yeah, back there is this sense of that it is kind of they've. I think Ghostbusters 2, it was basically, obviously Sony wanted it. Sony wanted the sequel. The cartoon was doing very well. The toys are doing very well. That's a great shot there with Vakeman just looking at camera. Um, so there were kind of, their arms were forced to do this. Yeah. Where, especially Bill Murray did not want to do it. Yeah. Um, but it sort of took a lot of persuasion. And um, and I, it was, uh, obviously got a pretty good, everyone probably got a good paycheck out of this, but it was hastily put together, I think. And, I think maybe going with the idea of the sort of the negativity of New York, I suppose it's quite a good sort of starting off point, but ultimately it it, it doesn't really make it a strong idea overall, I don't think. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, despite the bad reviews, it did do well financially. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's also a really, um, I was saying to you before, I think it's a middle-aged film. It's a, it's about becoming um, a dad too. I think you know, and I think that again, not to go too far with you know an auto theory or anything at this point, but um, you know, Ivan Reitman when he made the first film, he was he just made before that it was Stripes, mm. you know, and uh, you know, and then these that had Bill Murray in it, didn't it? And, uh, yeah, and it, Harold Ramis, and they're quite, but they're, yeah, and they're kind of adolescent films, you know. Yes. They're kind of you know, there's these kind of guys kind of mocking authority, you know, which the first Ghostbusters very much is as well too. Mm. But in this film, you know, I mean, um, Ryan Reitman was making, you know, this was in between. These these romantic comedies like Twins and then you know you've got um, well, kind, he, kind, kind Kindergarten Cop, Cop yeah and then Junior and he and his son is in this film it's I find it very much and and you know and and uh, Venkman becomes you know something of a, a sort of father you yeah. know so it's you, like, you think because basically Ivan Wright Ivan Reitman's kind of mellowed yeah where, with with age and and it's and it feels very much. Especially because we were talking about this before recording, and I think I even commented on this uh, in my retrospective a couple of years ago. Was that the pacing is very sort of pedestrian? Yeah, well, the structure is too, and the writing yeah, is, and how everything's kind of blocked out with the mega cameras. expositional. Mm, yeah, yeah. It, it just lacks the energy of the first one, um, yeah. where it felt like the, that's the thing. Ghostbusters, I think, is really it was lightning in a bottle. Yeah, and it's so difficult to replicate that again, and um, and obviously they're doing a third one. Um, well, it was a self-contained thing, and I think yeah. also too when we were watching the cartoon when we were growing up, yeah, you know, it was an episodic thing. Where it was every, you know, every Maybe twenty minutes, isn't it? You know, you know, long. but but it was it was the idea that the Ghostbusters were open for business all the time, yeah. whereas the whole point in the first one was this portal had opened, mm. a one-off, yeah. Once it's done, they you know defeat it. Dump, dump. We don't see that business doesn't. It ceases to exist. I mean, it finishes. Yeah. Ghostbusters businesses finishes before they even do the job. You know. Yeah. Um, What's they kind of comment on in this? Don't they? They do say you know once they've basically defeated it, they're, they're yeah. out of business. There's no more ghosts to to bust. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I oh, I was just going to comment too. We have got Peter McNichol Nickel here in this this sequence. He's one of the best things about this movie, I think. Really, him and Rick Rick Moranis. Well, um, it's where do you say Rick Moranis? Because I mean. At this time, Rick Moranis had become um, more of a kind of uh, Hollywood celebrity yeah. star. You know, he he was leading films, you know, Little Shop of Horrors and whatnot. And they shrunk the kids. Yeah, and he was he had a major part in Parenthood, which came out the same year, which is brilliant. Oh, look at the that, optical. That's, that is a creepy shot. It's really scary. It yeah. is. It's the most. I should have said it much earlier, but it's the most iconic painting, pe and I don't mean yeah. horror painting, painting in a movie. Yeah. Whenever a meme comes out and they have a painting in it, they'll always stick that one in it. Definitely. You know, did you see the one with Trump and the Pope? Yes. You know, yeah, yeah. And and th they could have used the one from Con I think Conjuring Two really made a good argument. It tried to make a good argument for another iconic horror, mm. um, you know, villain in a painting, but mm. it just this just it's t it, the Vigo one. Is it's just, just going to last forever. Yeah, it is really is. Yeah, iconic. You know, um, <laughs> I have a spit. 
how school? <laughs> and this sort of this whole bookshop is sort of more of a reflection, isn't it, of Dan Aykroyd's? Yeah, yeah, it's well, true life. He's well read, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose there was any vodka there. I was going to say just briefly about the production design too, because this is um, the production designer on this film was Bo Welch, who at that point had just done another Ghostbusters-inspired mega success and quite morbid in its own right, and that's um, Beetlejuice. Mm. And um, him and Tim Burton, they really, I think, I mean, I said this in the Batman commentary too, but they really kind of brought forward um, this kind of controlled colour palette look that you get in in, um, in uh, sort of modern movies. And you kind of see it in anything from, you know, I mean, the films like even The Cat in the Hat and whatnot, you know, you see that very colour-coordinated look with minimal, minimal colour, you know, small colour palette, you know. And um, we were saying because it's, this film is kind of almost shot like a comedy in some ways, more than the first film. Very flat photography, unfortunately. I think. I mean, it, it sort a lot of, of beige. It, gets, it gets a bit more dynamic later on. But yeah, I yeah, think, yeah. Because a lot of the sort of heavy dialogue scenes, it's just very, yeah. You say the beigey colours, and just you know, it lacks uh, the smoky atmosphere of the original one. It just, I don't know. It didn't. It felt the other, first one felt real, actually. It felt very grounded. Yeah. You know, you felt you kind of. Well, it's shot as a horror. I always mm. think that the first film visually feels a lot like American Werewolf in London, in that that was also a horror comedy, but it shot like a drama. Yeah. You know, and actually John Landis during that period, him and his cinematographer, they they always shoot stuff. So it it was like it would be of that genre, but they they wouldn't shoot it as a comedy. The camera they get coverage, um, which we can talk about later. You know, in terms of how you shoot in comedy, I basically say now, but in comedy traditionally. Um, you shoot, you know, as much what they call coverage as possible, which is different angles. So, you, for instance, here, you know, you've got, I mean, we're on a kind of single of Peter at the moment, mm. but you'd then have, you know, you'd have a wider shot of him on his own. You'd have over the shoulders of each person and whatnot. And and generally in comedy, not always, there are lots of exceptions to the rule, like something like Fish Called Wanda, you know, or Robert Zemeckis' stuff, Joe Dante, you know, where it's all camera moves and whatnot. But generally the feeling is that you like to have a lot of control over the way things are shot. And sitcoms, I think, you know, because of the way they're shot too, they're yeah. shot with a master shot and then you have all these separate singles so you can get the reaction actions that you yeah. need because a lot yeah. of comedy is reacting so that's the kind of basic 101 you know comedy directing and i feel in this it, it, it adheres more to that whereas in the first film as you said we had much more dynamic steady cam work and whatnot yeah. but i think this you know this is more of a performance movie i mean this is trying to there's so much exposition in the first 20 20 minutes it's lots of people talking yeah yeah i i i just don't think they really knew how to sort of get get the script off get off um what was it? Get off running, you know. They they were kind of it's a bit very much a slow start to this, and you don't get any sort of ghost busting till about maybe thirty minutes into it. Um, and which is you know you could argue which is fine because they are sort of you know getting back into the swing of things, but it it, it tries to because it's a five year gap. They've got to fill in that sort of void with information, and that's why you're getting huge dumps of kind of exposition to sort of say this is what's happened, this is what's going on, this is what's happened. You know, the past five years. Um, but I think for children though going into this because I mean, you, you've they've watched Ghostbusters the movie absolutely loved it like all, like we all did and you've been watching the cartoon and buying the toys whatever and you go watch this and you you know you're what 15 minutes into it and you're like Whew, you know getting a bit restless I think kids will probably be very very, very restless at this point you they, know? also too you can kind of I mean to be fair, when I watched it the first time, I never thought about the pacing. I was just waiting for the Ghostbusters. So, and, you, and you're not alive to kind of storytelling and how things are structured and whatnot. Mm. Um, I was just going to say, too, uh, this is probably the worst place to mention it, but um, <laughs> I'd mentioned to you before, I think that the with colours, those, yeah. the colour scheme and Bo Welch... Um, there is a sort of conflict of co of two colours in this film. Um, and it, it's funny because we mentioned the exact same colours in Batman. But there's red and there's green. Mm. And there's the red of the slime and there's the green of liberty. Mm. And in a lot of the marketing, and especially the DVD stuff that came out you know, later, you'll always associate those colours with Ghostbusters too. And you can see that in virtually every frame they're trying to get some green or some red or some kind of balance of green and red and it gets it starts off with so much beige at the beginning you don't really notice it mm. but certainly by the end of the film where they're stood outside the you know the museum you yeah. really see it you know that's right but uh, 
there is an interesting aspect to this though with the because they're now going to go outside and uh, check the spot where they where the where the um, the pram had stopped. Underneath, they've got their sort of the, the old train station, the underground, which is a sort of Victorian design, which I think is very interesting. I think there's something actually something they should have explored more in this. Because um, if anyone, we'll anyone listening, sort of probably played the video game of Ghostbusters, which is kind of you know essentially the, the third movie, which is set in 1991, um, they kind of explore more how this kind of ooze, this um, slime, has um, been building up. It's giant factories underneath underneath new york mm. and um and it all kind of links to um what was it the the, the architect mm. who built the building in the first one and and that's all kind of yeah Chandler, yeah it sort of ties everything together and i thought that was very quite very kind of kind of clever because this one you know vigo has no connection to at all to goza and all that lot and, no. and, and so it's I wish I don't mind. I mean, I think it's kind. Of, it's, yeah. There's loads of different. Essentially, he's a different demon. I was just going to say, we so. just seen Peter meeting Oscar for the first time. See, I think that should have been a bigger moment, much further on in the film, mm. because he's really having to accept that there's this child that really he feels he should have been his. Yeah, you know, um, and he sort of takes to it in that sort of you know that Bill Murray kind of like eh, sort of you know very mad about it. But I yeah. think. I think it should have been a bigger moment. Um, maybe he was, you know, when he has to save them and he first meets them. You know, I think that that probably would have been, you yeah, know, a lot yeah. better. Um, it seems just a bit of an afterthought because it's such it's such a key part for the, you know, who's he's basically the protagonist of the film, and mm. that's kind of his key, you know. Have you noticed the, the was it the uh, ectometer, isn't it? Yeah, that was used in like so many other films. That Suburban Commando has it. Uh, the film They Live, they use it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a weird, a prop that seems to get recycled. Well, it's cheap um, and, you know, you have to build a new one. Uh, <laughs> is this LA? I think this bit's LA. This looks sort of nondescript kind of yeah. anywhere. It, 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 it fits with the urban decay of New York. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can, we can, yeah, we'll mention that uh, a bit later. Oh, we've got a bit of red and a bit of red here. A little bit of green somewhere. <laughs> Well, there was. Did you did you play the video game of Ghostbusters Two? I did. Kid? Yeah. The NES. I played. A, I played it. I played your copy with you, in the room at the same time. No, you didn't. You liar. Because um, I played the. Because um, my friend had it. Because my Ghostbusters Two for me, my early experience of it was a, a strange one. Because my sister was going to go see it. Well, she went to go see it at the other Canon or an MGM cinema in eighty nine, and um, um, I remember her leaving, and I just basically threw up because my mum gave me banana flavored med- medicine, which is <laughs> worst medicine ever. And then I had to kind of wait to see this till it came onto tape. But my friend had got the video game, he thought, uh, the NES uh, version, which was insanely difficult and hard. And um, and I then, when I, had, well, I think we got a like, Commodore sixty four, and I had the version of that on the on the Commodore where you go down the sewer. And you've got this giant hand above you kind of coming down, knocking your 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 place you're playing as raised. You bounce back and forth trying to get the slime from the um, right, right. from the uh, underground. This um, is, I'm just going to say, this is one of my favourite moments it, in yeah, the film. Yeah, it made this, me jump Look at kid. how terrifying this is. Yeah. Children everywhere were traumatised when they saw this, I like to think, because <laughs> I certainly was. Um, and just the way that the head comes and in a wide shot, you know, you're yeah, looking and, and waiting this for it. this old, what, is this like a, a church or like a, a castle just covered in slime? I think it's yeah. brilliant design. I th- I want I want to see more of that, you know. I get the feeling that the that the slime things we've seen we've read that initially they were going to visualize this in a different way. Oh God, I love his voice. I love mm. Max von Sydow. Mm, we Cedar, found yeah. out we never knew. I mean, you look at this; they're going right into his lips, and you know, right where you're going to notice the sink. It's they make it, but yeah. it's totally it's ad out so wonderfully. Um, I mean, it's probably I don't know. I'm, I'm biased. I, all I can hear when I see, unfortunately, I can see uh, Wilhelm von Holmberg's mouth. <laughs> Is um, you know I love the music here too. It's really really good. It's just so ancient and it comes out of nowhere and it's, it's building up. It's, it's tension. There's so much, you know. There's so much power with that painting. We'll mm. mention it. And to traumatize you even more, we now see uh, Janos getting possessed. Yeah, the you child. know, it's a double whammy. I mean, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be there at night working in that. It's so weird how his career kind of started out because he was in um, what was it, Dragon Slayer, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I watched that. A couple of months ago, and um, I, th- I thought it was generally a pretty good film. But he was he was the hero, you know, yeah. playing. You know, now he's he's for, for the most part just known as as this kind of comedy character in Ali McBeal and yeah, things yeah. like that. Being uh, the movie, yeah, you know, this is oh, this 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 kind of 
I, I think it's a composite of a little bit of a set and a matte painting by ILM, mm. who took over Boss Film on this film. Um, and it's all sort of these Victorian textures of the ma- pneumatic transit, which I yeah. think was a real thing. Yeah. And um, I've said to you before, in Ghost... Oh, goodness. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going... I would not go anywhere near this. Um, <laughs> big, big fat nope. Um, no, I was before. You know, I mentioned in these films, in the Ghostbusters films, the one thing about the the look of them that's really integral, what was set in the first film, is the New York that they show isn't like the New York that you'll see in any other movie. Mm. You never see steel and glass and you know concrete buildings. You never see it, they always. They, it's production design, and the reason for that, very brilliantly in the first film, and carried on over brilliantly here too, is they're trying to get the feeling of a haunted house. Mm. across i this is my interpretation oh, anyway right. you know so if you go to new york and you visit all these different places like when people do the ghostbusters tour they kind of aghast that they have to go all all across manhattan to different places mm. that are nowhere near each other um and the shot selections in the film as well they'll only sort of use for you know anything that looks kind of pre-1940 they'll have in it and you know you'll see occasionally you'll see the world trade center or whatever in a in a long shot but it's always in this film it's all this old stone and it's all you know old new york and it connects yeah. with things like when the Titanic comes, yes, it's mm. really old New York, um, turn of the century New mm. York, you know. So when you see the Titanic, that is, across, that's a terrifying, shot you know. As well. But it fits in, and this I think fits in with that world too. Yeah, yeah. And and the terrifying moment is it this moment with the blackout? It is, isn't it? The blackout's the moment when he goes yeah, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, it just makes... I mean, I remember in the trailer, in the advertising, they kind of made that as a key plot point because they had... They did, they, didn't they? At the beginning, it shows, it shows this wide shot of Manhattan Island with all of the lights going out. And you think that's the beginning of the film. I mean, that would be a great film, wouldn't it? <laughs> great intro to the film. Here, this shot, here. You know, this map painting with all the, you know, all the stuff painted out. Um, but it makes... It really does make it feel claustrophobic. It feels like things are kind of come and get you. And, mm. the, you know, you're walking... I mean... That's one of the great things about the film, actually, is it there is this sort of suspense of stuff boiling underneath, which, you know, is, you know, the ghosts and also this this river of slime kind of boiling. And we've said, like with the first film, that the, the, the Ghostbusters world is very, it's sort of self-contained. It's not, um, you know, it's not a national threat or anything like that. No, it's always, know. everything was contained to New York, wasn't it? I mean, it's always kind of baffled me was once the Ghostbusters were essentially put out of business. Surely there must have been ghosts in California or up in Canada or something like that. <laughs> it's a massive long journey to go to work. But this is a really creepy scene. Yeah. Quite wrong, you know. Do you think, though, because even though he needs his eyes glow, as essentially they use to use them as, as a torch, but yeah. you can still kind of see down that corridor, can't he? Yes, but, but it's it just doesn't... a creepy look, yes. isn't it? Yes, yeah, that's, all, that's all it's all about. And, and it's to show you still that he is possessed. Yeah, yeah. It? There was a thing around this time, I think, started off by Bronson Pinchet as Serge in um, Beverly Hills Cop, where you had these, uh, you know, these American actors. Um, you know, doing this kind of, you know, these eccentric characters, uh, mm. you know, with the uh, over the top voice, these camp performances, you know, and um, I, th- I think, and it, Father of the Bride was another one, Martin Short. Mm. And I find it really odd that they basically took Rick Moranis' character and they've reworked it for this, for you know. Else, yeah. uh, it leaves a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth, but it's, it's, you know, I think he really goes for it and gives all the energy he can. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a fantastic, this is one of the best. <clears throat> Um, sequences yeah um, yeah it, this is the moment that they, they pushed a lot in the trailer as well where you see the Scaleri brothers kind of smash up the the judge's desk um. <laughs> I mean that's the other thing too with Lewis they now made, they've made him a lawyer yeah he was an accountant beforehand wasn't he well, he's, yeah. he's, still, he's still there an accountant but he's, he's kind of learnt to be a lawyer in night school didn't he yeah, yeah. I mean, this, the other thing about this film is, as I say, the, the first film, it's all, you know, so much, it's so business centric, and they desert all of that in this film. It's none of it at all. No. In fact, the only, there's one montage after this, you know. Uh, oh, I forget her name. Um, well, she passed away as well. I think. Yeah, yeah. And she's in Annie Hall. I forget her name. Oh, that's terrible. Um, but she's. You know, I just think all the performances, Harris Yulin is the judge, who's mm. brilliant in a film called Fatal Beauty, if you ever check mm. that out, would you? Uh, do you notice they got the dissolve wipe yeah, going across? Yeah, George Lucas wipe there. You know, something that you'd see more in something like Three Stooges short or something. Like, it's really going for... Yeah, they, ne- they never had that in the first one. Yeah. Some of the jokes here are just so funny. I mean, <laughs> he really... 
We, you and I had trekked to a shop, I think, that had got movie memorabilia in it, which you like, you like to frequent. Yeah. And um, we'd, we'd just seen, there was, a, I think it was a Starburst or something from, Star 1980, Log, yeah, from 1989. And the, the, right at the top above the title, it, it says, Rick Romano steals Ghostbusters 2 or something on the front cover, you know, <laughs> to promote the film, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, we're seeing it here. I mean, this is another example of, of, of a location that just looks, you know, it's very, very old. I remember reading in a book, I think it was in your Ghostbusters Making of book thing, yeah. that this was this was from uh, 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 Legal Eagles, the um, Ivan Reitman film. Right. Yeah. Um, I've never a huge... Comedies, oh, there's a quite a lot of comedy films I've had, I've had, sorry, I've seen, which are always set in a fucking courtroom. Yeah. There's quite a few Adam Sandler ones, there's a Jim Carrey one. Um well, there's, uh, there's plenty more, but yeah, I'm never yeah I'm liar always, liar. I'm, yeah, I'm never a huge fan of sort of comedies set within a courtroom. I think it's just, it, it's it's a it's a sort of a tired. Uh, Sometimes it feels it can element. be exhausted, but there's yeah. a lot of energy in this. Is you know I think this is really quite well done. Well, thankfully they blow up most of it thanks to the uh, the ghosts. I was going to mention just about the ghosts in this too, um, because I think that I've seen I've said to you before, but. I said on the Batman Batman commentary too, but in the eighties there seemed to be this you know dark this kind of dark subject taboo subject of death, mm. you know dead bodies, um, ghosts of of real people in this film because these mm. these the, the Sclery brothers are people that the Judge Wexler yeah yeah you know had he put away and, and recognizes them so you're recognizing dead you know dead mm. people I mean it's really yeah. grim and morbid yeah. and this is a kids film that was marketed you know mm. to Burger King and whatnot you know yeah. um, and it's it's well, it, the it's the first a, one had weird monsters. Which which the cartoon had had a lot of actually. Yeah, well know. they they were kind of these. Um, uh, yeah, they, well they were dimensional, weren't yes, they? Yes, dimensional. Yeah, but they creatures. but they also they had you had things like the librarian, you had the taxi driver, and they make a huge impact. Mm. Um, and I've always felt you know there's something about the dead in there, especially the Ghostbusters are kind of you know they're not young people in their twenties, um, and just go along with the middle age thing too. I've always felt with Ghostbusters because you don't see any children in the first film too. It is almost like it's pointing at death, you know, <laughs> and, and, and this very much so. And I remember just seeing this and just thinking this is horrible. You know, the idea that, you know, we're kind of, you know, I was a very sensitive child, but you know, <laughs> the idea that you're seeing, uh, you know, a, a, a visualization of somebody who's died, mm. you know, who wasn't very nice, you know, yeah. um, you know, just thinking that's just, it's so dark and, and utterly morbid. And it, rem it reminds me of how in the Tim Burton Batman films and stuff, you see corpses just lying around, mm. you know, um, and you just sort of accept it. But these, these this were the PG big, as well. You know. And these were the big box office hits. I mean, there's st dark stuff in Indiana Jones and whatnot too. We love it. We love all this, oh, this yeah. morbid. We've got, well, it's, 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 there's, there's always should be, you know, a, you know, a little like scares in, in yeah. essentially family friendly movies i think uh, that's uh, jim henson was always kind of like fought against like you know the, the ratings for sort of yeah. like for, for having too much of a horror in a kid's film but i think some kids the kids should be kind of scared to a certain degree absolutely but um, this is very dark this is very adult dark humor mm. you know especially in, in the courtroom where everyone's very jaded mm. and cynical notice the hair notice the hair starts yeah it's not the, the winds coming yeah, in from yeah, the thing. yeah yeah as we Burn progressively the steak. yeah here come the scolaris i just think this is amazing yeah you just don't expect it either. And the fact that they're being, you're actually seeing them during their electrocution as well. So it's the moment, it, they're living out the moment when they're, they've, they've died yeah. over and over and over again. It's not even at the afterlife. It's the moment in which, you know. Um, there's another rule with Ghostbusters too, which in the 2016 one, I only sort of became aware of as I was watching it. Yeah. But in these films, there is a sort of unwritten rule that the ghosts don't kill ever. They're kind of they're nuisances. It's a pain. They off, absolutely traumatise you. They scare you to death, but they they you know they will never actually really kill you. Mm. Um, and like there's a bit in here where the lawyer gets picked up and taken off, and then if you notice in the end credits, they show her yeah, she's just lying yeah. next to the door, and you can see her in the wide shot actually afterwards lying next to the door too. Oh, I love it. I just love his, his <laughs> when he words. comes into shot, yeah. you know, <laughs> he's just like what? I love this shot here when they look around the corner because that's a great. Yeah sort of comedic, comedic moment you know yeah that but that empty courtroom with the empty seats you That's know good work you can't yeah. you know well it's a composite as well yeah. isn't it of, of the ghosts 
I think Harris Ewan's so good. Like the tone of this as well is just brilliant. It's so effortless. Yeah. I love how he was like, he was like, willing to give them the chair or burn them at the stake whatever but yeah. then he, as soon as he jumps out it was like right next to him going they're the Scaleri brothers you know so he was kind of this completely switched through that he needed protection from them from the ghost sorry yeah. this music here too is great oh it's it's it's, it's bizarre that they're st- they still haven't actually released the score to this you know Edelman's score at times as you said it has hints of the cartoon but I think chiefly really from where he came from and the type of music of the time I it reminds me more of the touchstone comedies and romantic comedies of the late 80s mm. stuff like um, Three Men and a Little Baby mm. the kind of electric piano you know going to his Broadway roots there's a little bit of like Romance in the Stone kind of vibe yeah 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 what exactly, was doing. Yeah. yeah well it's like an ensemble of um you know keyboards and musical cues here yeah it's great the silence the use of silence here in the dread and just this this is iconic moment from the film this is the power of of just not seeing them as well such little is done here it's just chairs being thrown you know our imaginations just piece things together and it's it's, and it's cliche, but it is just far scarier. Because you mentioned earlier on with that, you know, ILM taking over from Boss. Um, yeah. Because I think I think eighty nine. I don't know what Boss were doing actually in eighty nine. They weren't doing Die Hard too. Well, um, it's it's when you look at the history of how it happened. Because you, yeah. you, really, this began with Poltergeist. It, Richard Edland did yeah. the visual effects. While he was at ILM, did the visual effects for Poltergeist, and then uh, Raiders of the Lost. Oh no, did. He did Raid Lost. Raid Lost Art first, yeah, yeah. and it had sort of ghost effects in it. Mm. Then he did Poltergeist. Mm. Then won the Oscar for um, Earth. Is it twenty ten? Did he win the Oscar for that? Sorry, no. Wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Going back, yeah. he'd done those two films. Then he did Ghostbusters. Then yeah. he did. Um, is it Fright Night as well? Which had a lot. I think mm. some of the designs carried over or whatever. And mm. then and Poltergeist two mm. as well. So they, you know, he re- and that was well. He had Boss Film, his own company. Yeah, he did Masters, didn't he? As well. You know, but they're all like he. He became a specialist in ghosts, and for whatever reason, they went with ILM. For this film, yeah, yeah, I fi- uh, they used a lot of the cr- some of the crew, like um, I think the optical cameramen and whatever had come over from you the know animators to do the um, the streams, yeah, and um, but it, w- it, it for me it carries over very well. It very seamlessly looks. It does. Like- it does. I, I th- actually I think it's not particularly innovative. I don't think. No, but- no. I I I, th- I do think that silence o- there. Overall, the, the effects are far more consistent consistent in this one. Um, the first one has amazing moments where you have got Slimer eating. You know, yeah. when he sees them at the table, it's incredible stuff. And the ghost when you, you know, the librarian. But there's other optical effects where they look very dirty and a bit rough around the edges. With well, this one, I think they are a bit more consistent. Um, I think it's just down to, you know time as well. But right. obviously, ILM had so much going on in '89. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they, they could, that's why they couldn't do Star Trek Five, and that suffered. Yeah, I um, love the way that they reinvent. Janine for this film. Oh yeah, too. she's great. In she's it, much yeah. more confident well, too. It's the cartoon version of Janine as well. I, 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 mm. See, I was saying this to Tim beforehand. The Ghostbusters two logo, where he's got the ghost in the cool sign, or actually symbolising two, um, is fine to do it in the marketing of the movie, the posters. But in the film, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it kind of works. I think they should just kept the original Ghostbusters logo. You know. But they can, they've jazzed up the car, which is cool. They've just put more shit on it, like, I don't know, like a bath or something, or, I don't know, hazard sure. tape. Well, I remember when the film... Oh, this other weird, yeah, like... Another dead person. Yeah, like a haunted runner. But he's know? not doing anything wrong. I, yeah. I mean, I think I found that troublesome <laughs> too when I was growing <laughs> yeah. up. I'm like, well, he's just dead and he's he just... doesn't have a choice, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're, doing, they're back doing the commercial. Well, this, the film. funny thing is, as I said, in the first film, you know, it's, it's um, you know, very business centric. And here, really, this, the, 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 this montage isn't really doing anything to do. It's only business moment in the film, really. But it's setting up their relationship for later, having mm. them in bed together, having uh, Janine and Louis in bed. Yeah. Um, and isn't it odd how, as you said, like we've got uh, Janusz going with, trying to um, win the affections of uh, Dana, yeah. you know, and that, but then, you know, the, the, the kind of hinted chemistry that's there with, um, with um, Janine and... Um, Mick Moranis. No, Egon in the first one. Oh, yeah, yeah, that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they kind of throw that away. This is a lovely visual effect with the uh, the diamonds. Yeah, stuff. that's that's. I always want because in the video games you had always flying like you know diamond stuff and these like chandel- chandeliers, whatever. I mean, that was the only moment in the film where you had that. And this is obviously because of the cartoon. Because obviously we've seen the Ghostbusters now wearing a different color suit. So they're sort of like charcoal gray. 
mm. um, outfits, and you saw Slimer's now hanging around the head Ghostbusters headquarters to sort of show, hey, Slimer's kind of a friend, but he's only more, he's basically a nuisance to Rick Moranis, you know. Um, there is a random deleted scene that was on the Blu ray that has, you know, him. Uh, him trying to chase after Slimer uh, with his with the ecto pack, whatever the proton pack, um, and this was not far away from when they did the uh, Ghostbusters and Slimer cartoon, yeah, where they had a much more. Kind it of shows you that Slimer was becoming more popular than the Ghostbusters, wasn't it? That's why yeah. they made him the sort of the figurehead of the show. It was weird. And this is the part now with the emotional slime, and then they play Jackie Wilson at some point here, yeah, too, yeah. I was going to say in the in the new 2016 Ghostbusters, they had yeah. there's a is it DeBarge they play, don't they? Um, Rhythm of the Night, yeah. 80s track, and there's a lot of 80s nostalgia now. If you did, weren't born in the 80s and you think, oh, you know, it seems to all be about the 80s. In in this film, well, just coming up, they have a Jackie Wilson track. You know, they have Higher and Higher, which then they then re-recorded for the you know for the end sequence where mm. they do an 80s version of it, but. Um, in the in the in the 80s it was very much about especially around this time it, there was lots of use of music from kind of 19 mid 1950s to the mid 1960s that mm. was kind of the point you know oh, back um, to the future is a whole love letter to that yeah yeah mm. but i mean even the year after this you know you had things like ghost with unchained melody you know you had um, mermaids um shoop shoop song yeah well, was share, you know it? pretty woman yeah you know um and, and it was you know that kind of looking back and and, and anyway, it was the same. It's always been the same. In you know, in twenty years' time or whatever, they'll eventually be looking back to now or whatever. You know, it's yeah. it's just it's a way it always it's the way it always kind of goes. Um, but it's uh, yeah. it's weird though when you you know think about it because people that who were you know in the twenties during the eighties who you know I've spoken to who hated the eighties, didn't like it at all, and then they just biz- they just find it so bizarre that people of our, our age or yeah. maybe younger who kind of look back with it with nostalgia you know it's it's you know the other thing about higher and higher later that they sing this is jackie wilson well they, they use it with the um they have ha- such a liberty yeah they? they have a re-recording and it's by howard huntsbury yes. and howard huntsbury had been there was a film that came out again looking back at the past this was a there's a film called la bumba about uh richie valens the singer yeah um and Howard Huntsbury, from what I remember, actually plays Jackie Wilson in the film. So here they've got him to do a Jackie oh Wilson God. song. So there was a lot of looking, you know, looking back to that time. I mean, do you remember in this country, in, in the UK, if you type Jive Bunny into, into Google, that was a big thing. And, you know, mm. Twist and shit, you know, yeah. they were all, it was all about looking back. And, um, yeah. So this, you know, this little moment here, I mean, it just doesn't quite work, does it? The sort of comedy yeah. there, it, it just... No one sees the, the the vibe I always had with this film was that because it was kind of a the, you know Sony wanted a sequel and and the filmmakers and the, and the and, the, and the, the cast were kind of I think somewhat reluctant to do it most probably you know often the case with Bill Murray especially with doing a third one because he you know said no for so many years and that's what kind of stopped it ever happening um, and throughout this film, you do get this this vibe that people most most you get a sense that they're kind of phoning it in. They're not really passionate mm. about it. They're, they're it's a job. They've got to you know they're they're professionals. They'll just do they'll do a good job, but they won't be like we're not, they're not in love with this film. They're not well, it's not the, the first time you know the other. It's very yeah. unfair to judge it to to Ghostbusters. I think they did a great they did an absolutely great job with with what they have. And you know I I certainly uh, you know uh, I can't you know it just for me it just lacks. And energy, that's the problem, I think. Yeah. And Ivan Reitman's just comfortable. Everyone feels comfortable. And, like, there's no, like, under the gun. There's no pressure, like, to... Obviously, there's pressure to deliver this kind of movie and, and meet expectations. But, you know, it's like... It's like um, when filmmakers have a ginormous budget, they, they don't feel super creative in that way. When you've got less money, you end up being pushing yourselves to the limit, you know. I love how he shakes his hand there. The music we just heard, that mu- romantic music, the Randy Edelman stuff, I mean, that really sounds like something from a Bette Midler comedy yeah, in 1988. Yeah. doesn't quite work. You know. It doesn't work in this. I was going to say, just with the painting here, um, there was that brief optical before, but again, there's just the power of this paint, this magnificent painting, that pose. Do you know who painted this? It was an ILM artist, This was, was it? I or... think it's a photo. It's a doctored photo. Right. Um, oh, yes, because there's... 
there's a great behind the scenes stuff. You go on YouTube. There's someone had uh, one of the FX guys had filmed yes. on a, uh, with a VHS recorder tape tape machine and um, filmed them doing this. And there's them filming how Vigo comes out of the painting. Yeah, and you kind of you actually see him. It's like a, it's like what they how they've also photographed it to paint this. So it's like mural, he, isn't it? He steps Foreground out. Areas, he steps out yeah. of it, and I was like, "Fucking yeah, that looks amazing." Why isn't that in the film? My feeling is right at the beginning. You know, yeah. you see the you see that shot of the head going up. And, yeah, you know, and they show. I think what happened was people probably there was a disconnect maybe mm. when the audience see it. Where's this? How's the slime connector stuff? Yeah. So you see it. You know, mm. um, I was just going to say just with this this sequence here with the painting. There's so much power in that painting and. I, I get, I mean, I still, you know, my heart kind of goes when Peter goes to try and paint the, 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 the kitten, yeah. you know, the painting, because even though it's not, it's, there's no visual effects and it's not going to move. He could just reach out. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Even know. though, and it's all in camera, like the whole mm. thing, you know, they have to do so such little work as filmmakers, whereas I think, you know, perhaps, you know, a less uh, accomplished filmmaker might, or, you know, a, a less imaginative filmmaker might have decided to, to just make him change subtly or do something. But in our minds, we're just looking at things, you know. Mm. All the great horror films are about us using our, our, our imaginations. There's a, the part coming up here, I'm, I'm never a, a huge fan of seeing the bath sort of but, but mm. attempt to eat Oscar. Um, it's a little London spy. Yeah, and it's, but they, they use the sound effect of this kind of, I, mean, I think it's a lion or maybe a tiger or whatever mm -hmm. probably a lion but they they recycle that sound effect um, they used it when the 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 slime t attempted to grab Ray in the sewer right. and then they use it again at the end when Vigo is right. kind of getting affected by the public outside of there okay. sort of being more positive and it was a thing we were commenting on yesterday well, with the Batman commentary was the recycling of explosion sound effects right. and because um, nice. American movies often had a little bit more a bit more sassy with their sound design mm. and um, this seems to have taken a step back with sound design a little bit because they're just recycling sound effects from you've heard so many times before I think it's even the same sound effects they use for the dogs in Ghostbusters. Mm. Okay, look, I've got an argument here for the red and green. If you see the, if you see uh, that Christmas tree silver, yeah, <laughs> your theory's wrong. <laughs> There isn't much for Sigourney Weaver to do in this film. Well, well, she's. Do you think she has more to do in this than she does in the first one? I suppose you think it's equal. No, I mean. Well, she spends basically. She gets to be the villain in the yeah, first one. Yeah, that's true. This one, she's. She just basically just uh, just plays the role of a mother, just basically, but just watching over her child. Tell me one thing that she get one action she gets to do in this film. Um. What action sequence you mean? Well, one thing, one that moment, is, one great moment she has. Um, that's tough. I don't think I don't think she has. There's any one scene where she attempts to grab Oscar and she gets thrown back, and she has to sort of try and she she tricks Janos to say, "Hey, okay, we'll be, you know, you know, partners when Vigo takes over to let her so she can get close to Oscar." And she attempts to take him. Can you believe that the Oscar-nominated Sigourney Weaver is probably the most high-profile actor in this mm. film? Doesn't have a moment in the film. No, no. She's given nothing to do. I, I, I just think they, yeah, they, they had to bring her back because it's. You know, it's Ghostbusters. You know, they bring they wanted to bring all the cast back. To I mean, there's an argument too. Maybe she didn't want to, and maybe you know, it cuts down the days that she was filming as well. I don't. Maybe. I mean, we could just we can speculate just as as fans. My feeling is, and I, I feel you know, I I think it's a missed opportunity. We could have had rather than having Rick Moranis being coming a, a film official of Ghostbusters at the end. Mm. Uh, it's been said elsewhere, but why couldn't that have been Dana? You know. Hmm. Why couldn't she have had a moment? I, I, I don't think she at all had any interest in the, the paranormal her character does. She, she's just, she wants this kind of normal life. Couldn't she be integrated into the t team? I mean, she gets, she gets, ra she gets a vacuum cleaner wrapped around her neck at one point. Mm. I think that's about it. You know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm, this is just looking at the film now. 
Mm. You know, I I wasn't bothered about this at the time. I just it's just it's so it'd, it'd be interesting at. to see what Sigourney Weaver felt felt about this because she, I know she'd you know she appreciates you know the sort of the fandom of Ghostbusters and she liked making it, but I the the role was never. I think it's just a kind of another job for her. I think she she just yeah. enjoyed making it, but it wasn't. She's oh, will always be known as Ripley, wasn't it? And yeah. that's what you defined her. Um, I mean, we're simplifying this too. You know, mm. I'm just I'm asking these questions. We're just, just kind of speculating. You know, that's all. You know, yeah, we don't, we don't know the answers to. Uh, and her, she's her great. True feelings on Ghostbusters. She's great know. as Dana, but I just I do find there are many scenes where there's lots of it's kind of wasted and repetitive, and mm. you know. Which is a shame because there are so many great moments in this film yeah. that have stayed with me, and you mm. know, because she, she essentially now she just goes on a date with Vakeman and just becomes oh the the bit at the restaurants is a bit dull as well. I mean, it, it's the setting as well. It's very as I think Tim pointed out earlier with the sort of use of beige. This is very beigey movies, late eighties, early nineties had a lot of that. Mm. Um, wasn't a fan of. I love this moment here. I absolutely love it. I love this sort of. The, the energy, of, yeah, the steady yeah. cam, steady cam, yeah, and you got the activeness, walking around, and then on, on location, and yeah. also the characters are coming together again, and they're being the Ghostbusters, as yeah, a team, yeah, probably for the first time, but all four of them are there. And he talk, I, I love the moment where they talk about Vigo's past and how he was killed, and and just when his head died, he goes, "I'll be back," you know, um, a sort of skeletal moment at the end of He Man movie. Uh, but I wanted to know more about Vigo. I wanted to sort of see, you know, old... Maybe they sort of just went... They did actually... Because all they do in this, they go on essentially the internet and find some information about Vigo. Um, they could have gone through the libraries and fa- found old information about him, you know. Yeah. That would have been a little bit more interesting to sort of explore his backstory. This is a great a shot. More. Nice shot. Yeah. It is very low contrast, though, the film. You know, when we, I watched... Again, when I watched the film initially on, you know, on television... And it's like, what is it, a 16 millimeter, you know, scan, pan and, and scan yeah, job yeah. thing, you know. And it, it, I think it adds a lot more contrast, or my memory of it having more mm. contrast. And I think looking at the publicity stills at the time, I remember more contrast. And this, this looks really, really low contrast. And certainly compared to the first film. When, when they walk in, they, they say, you know, sucking the guts guys with the Ghostbusters. I mean, there is this, when you see them, that they're, they, they do look a bit schlubby in this. That everyone. Uh, it's like no one said to them, do you want to get, get get down to the gym and sort of work out a little bit because you're Ghostbusters, you know, you want to look a little bit trim. But everyone's like, nah, nah, nah. Because Harold Ramis, he ballooned after this, you know. If you've seen the making of Groundhog Day, he's a, he's a big lad. And Dan Aykroyd's, you know, this is probably the last film where he, I don't know, maybe it was relatively slim, I suppose. There's great suspense here, maybe I cone heads, maybe. I was just going to say there's great suspense here. Just with Vigo, just cutting away to Vigo when they're doing mm. all this as they're Well, this kind of sets him. up that he... Ray's easy to manipulate yeah, and take yeah. over and that's like the end where he you know, possesses him. You mentioned this earlier, there's a tiny is it this the, moment? The, after the shot here there's a little optical effect which basically it, shows that he's gonna In the eyes of Vigo. Yeah. Look there. Very yeah. Cool, yeah. And that's a great visual. I mean that's great visual storytelling because you know mm. exactly what's happening from the mood and the you know, sound effects. I like. I mean, this cheeky moment here where Vankman says, "I, I work with Better," and <laughs> yeah. looks over. Uh, you know, sort of. It's like teasing a piranha, isn't it? It's yeah. really, really sticking your hand in I the just, lion's. You, you know. I just looking at Janos. He's just so upset and just like, "Oh, I'm in so much trouble," you know. Yeah. Because his master's just been basically humiliated, you know. The, the apartment's really good, that's too. That's a great shot. Yeah, I, I mean, it. that's another one where they've selected something that just looks so turn of the century. Yes. So stone, so, you know. But the in, the interior, not so there, much. Yeah, there's there's not much sort of modern architecture. It's almost like a sitcom, kind of. Yeah. I do like Vaitman's apartment. I think it's cool. <laughs> she cleaned. Green chairs. There we go. Yep. Yeah. Is that a computer on the left? Is that a TV monitor? What is a weird... It's a weird monitor. It's a good prop from the the prop company. <laughs> they hide it from it. I love how he's got... Look at the back. He's got the newspapers from the first one. Right. Well, that all part of the montage. That's clever. Mm. 
So we noticed too, hadn't we? We watched in the deleted scenes on this Blu-ray. This is the Blu-ray. Which Blu-ray yeah. is this? We're watching the most the recent one. Yeah. This is the most recent Blu-ray. And on the de deleted scenes that we noticed, we found a version of this scene, or is it a later scene? It's a scene where basically, with it, where um, after they've discovered in the photos that the photos are haunted. You know that this image of Vigo is there. So they go, okay, we've got to go underground and find the slime, and then they go to the apartment to invite peter along with them and they and it's basically a scene that they obviously weren't happy with and we shot and they had it outside it's an alternative isn't yeah it, alternative take yeah which is better I, yeah yeah because yeah. it's just it's because at the end of the day it's just another sh another sequence where they're shooting inside in indoors, yeah. it's just boring yeah you know? i'm sure and the bill and the filmmakers probably thought it was boring so oh we've got to redo this let's have it outside it's a bit more dynamic you know i think we talked a lot about the uh, the look and the production design but i think it is pretty integral to a, a mm. you know there's a kind of visceral feeling that you get with a horror film you know do you, do you think this is bo welsh's kind of weaker efforts do you think because he's well i think i think all films his work are, is far more uh, you know out there it's you know it's very much you can recognise it so... Well, firstly, he's doing easy. a sequel and he's having to replicate so much of the the, the stuff that was done by John DeCure on the first film. Um, and so there are those constraints. Also, to you know, we don't know what the parameters were in terms of the actors and their availability. Because remember, they, the, the film is... All the location stuff, not all of the location stuff, but all of the all of the recognisably New York location stuff is actually shot in New York, or actually in this film with Liberty. Most of it's done with with visual effects, um, but then they've got lots of interior stuff and lots of studio stuff that's Must done well in Los I. Angeles as well. Mm. And you've got actors from different places who all have to be in, you know. And it, just in, at the moment, we've got the firehouse. You know, you've got the outside is shot in in New York and the inside in LA. Um, I think just looking at the colour coordination and everything, I think it's fantastic. I think it's it's, it's really well wor worked out. I mentioned to you before as well that the cinematographer of this film, Michael Chapman, and um, and Bo Welch had both designed. You know, they'd both um, been the cinematographer and production designer on Joel Schumacher's The Last Boys. Yeah, yeah, and that is a very visually distinct film with a lot of high contrast look yeah. but again it's not going for this sort of high contrast this uh, you know pop this kind design. of yeah, yeah i mean there's there's a thing um, in comedy too i mean this is this is getting a bit technical but um Generally, when people say when you shoot a comedy, and you hear Mel uh, Brooks talk about this, um, in fact, he mentions it on the Spaceball when, he, when he's talking about the making of Spaceballs. When he has his sets and stuff, he likes everything to be lit, so it's almost like flood lit, so you can see the expressions on people's because there's a lot of reacting, yeah, you know, in comedy. So the idea is that there's this sort of unwritten rule that it should be flatter, that things should look mm -hmm. like a comedy. I think this has been disproved by films such as Ghostbusters, such as American Werewolf in London. You mm -hmm. know, I think you can shoot a, uh, you can shoot something cinematic. The Pink Panther films are shot quite cinematically too, but but they'll have a balance, you know. Mm. Um, you know, even something like um, the, the Abbott and Costello films, you know, as well, which which play with genre. You know, you I don't think you have to be that way. For, but for whatever reason with this film, it's just going for a much lower contrast kind of aesthetic. Mm. Uh, and I think there's a lot of beige that appears on Do you think screen. that's a quicker way of filming as well? With yes, that, that, way. that tends to happen because, yeah. you know, to do detailed stuff. I, I, I felt it's a little bit like... So with the with the camera with the camera setups and choices of angles it's, it feels like a Le Richard Lester movie in some way well I was saying to you really, got I, a close I, up wide you know that's it done get it in a bag yeah um, everything is all about head hype there's nothing really done on it it's cold, every, majority of it is all locked off as well there isn't much yeah. movement uh, as as we, we kind of pointed out earlier where you had a little bit of steady cam stuff but there isn't much of it with well, the first one it had a lot had a lot of movement I mean this might well be a two camera film I can't mm. remember I didn't I should have done my homework on that before I mm. didn't think to um, but yeah it's not and in the first one we had all those really sort of dynamic um, steady cam shots and you had yeah. that amazing sequence with the fountain you know it, it, where they, you've got everything on zoom lenses too with um, Dana and um, Peter as they're walking through with uh, you know when they, they they're outside the, um, the the concert place you know? yeah um, really sort of intricate almost Robert Altman style you know mm. camera moves and whatnot um, whereas this yeah this is much more conventional and safe. I also think maybe the lower, like at this point in time, this is again very technical, but um, they had much more kind of uh, sort of light sensitive film stock, which was grainier around this time as well. Mm. Um, everything used to be shot on 100 ASA film, which, you know, you'd need to light things up and this, the, the, the contrast was a lot higher. And in the late 80s, they sort of introduced this stuff. And a lot of late 80s films, 
kind of have this kind of very low contrast grainy look to them as mm. well um so there's there's a number of reasons and i don't put it down to one person you know th these things just they can happen yeah. you know because film is a very collaborative art there isn't one person who's just punching things or letting things down it's i mean you've worked you mm. you've, you're making you've, you're, you're in feature film at the moment you've been through this you know what yeah. it, it feels like you know uh, and any filmmaker will will take will tell you the same thing and there's so many logistics involved on on the, you know and especially on a sequel to what was one of the biggest films of that decade biggest comedies ever made um and yeah, there's certainly a lot of pressure there isn't there that's what's and but you've yeah and they want it out with a release date this funny enough this came out in the summer in america but in the UK, it came out at Christmas, which is far more in keeping with the theme of the movie. And I just, I can't really watch a Christmas movie in the summer. It just feels odd to me. You know, it's boiling hot. You go in, they're all celebrating Christmas in some form well, or manner. Well, that argument, isn't there? Of, yeah. yeah, the whole thing. This is a great scene here. This bit, I mean, you know, the BBFC, you know, was a proper strict and tight during the 80s. But this bit, you got, you've got, you know... Uh, there's heads on spikes. Yeah. Human heads on Human spikes. Human heads. Oh, that voice. Yeah. Oh. It's but funny, but it's also dark. having a, a train that's a ghost. Yeah. That's like the cartoon. But also they mentioned that. Oh, they mentioned that in the first one where the guy goes, "My grandmother talked about a train that would rock it past her house when she grew up." Yeah. You know, that's kind of a play on that I suppose well this is fictitious isn't it the event of what happened here but the as you say well I, I don't know I mean th this is this is again this is a very sort of turn of the century kind of mm. ghost that you know something it's a Victorian ghost we see a lot of you know sort of turn of the century stuff yeah stuff that you, you that you you know we've mentioned this before about having um st like still photos of the t of that time that mm. really you know I think they scared us quite a lot and you can see in th films like James Wan's films and whatnot w with things like Insidious and the Conjuring yeah. movies where they're you know they're they're going for trying to recreate that kind of look I mean there's that uh, if I'm for the next 30 seconds it's spoiler so from now but in the film um <laughs> it, 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 I don't know if it is Insidious there's that tiptoe through the tulips kid who's mm. dancing who's done in this style uh, I don't know if is that even a spoiler I don't know but um but but you know but it's something about that that's terrifying that's really scary oh the sound here of this is really really scary this visual effect by the way wasn't done by ILM this was done by Apogee John Dykstra's, Dykstra's company, company yeah. yeah what's really interesting too is Die Hard first one was Boss Films yeah did the visual effects? ILM did the sequel, and on the and, and mm. on that same sequel, Apogee also did additional work. Uh, yeah, weird. So, yeah, so they 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 could have taken on too much they can handle. You know what I mean? It's very interesting. I think probably that like, Boss Film probably wanted too much money, and ILM said, "Yeah, we'll do it for a bit less." Who knows? I yeah, mean, that's you know. generally that's what, generally what it is. The politics of it all is just usually about money. But this, from what I remember reading as well, this set. It's it wasn't like fully completed from what I think. Have I got this right? Like it's just, you know they've just got the tracks laid down and it's a lot of it's done with lighting. Yeah. But it really um, yeah it's really you only see a bit of it when a train goes past. You can see it lights up the the background where Winston is. So yeah. You can see a bit of it, but this is like the because I mentioned earlier to Tim um, was before we recorded because we watched a couple of scenes and when you've got the the sound when you they look at the the photo um, where Ray goes, that's the river of slime. And he just, the sound effect go, boo, like that. And it was, it reminded me, I think Nightmare on Elm Street have that sort of sound effect. And these colours as well, it's typical, like, that's what New Line Cinema were kind of using that sort of colour scheme for their horror films. It's very much like the blob, the, the yeah, Chuck Russell. Yeah, 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 Chuck Russell one. Yeah, I love that film. I wonder if they took uh, inspiration good. from that. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it does look like, I forget what the, what it's called the the substance that they use but it's what they use to fill milkshakes and i wonder if it's it's that's right it's yeah. similar thing but it looks more like paint in this i mean this is just terrifying i do i do think they kind of loop winston's cries like oh and he goes down the corridor goes right, down yeah. the uh down the tunnel there's a little bit of these mats too are a bit um fringy i think a little when they when they get pulled in they go slightly transparent yeah yeah I think, yeah you know. it's not a particularly good effect but because it's they're, cause they're quite small within frame, I mean, it's okay in, a, in the two, three, five, one aspect ratio, but if you saw it pan and scan, that would look a bit shit. Mm. 
I, th- I think Ghostbusters 2, I, I remember, I recall someone saying that the early rental copies were in widescreen, but it was kind of 185, 166, and the borders were blue. Really? Because I had the Superman 3 American tape, and they kept the opening sequence in widescreen, right? Uh, where the UK tape didn't, it went pan and scan, but the borders were blue. Right. So weird. Why was it blue? I don't know. There's a nice contrast here, I think, with the restaurant sequence and everything that we've seen before, which is obviously very mm. scary, very claustrophobic. And then you open and you've got people around you here, mm. you know. She's been a green dress. You know. Yeah, this, the, my production. My makeup's not very good on this. It's just a bit <laughs> splattered on. I seem to remember that in, the, in some making of footage, you can see them filming this sequence. And I think they do use two cameras. Mm. I love the bit where he goes, he goes, what do you want to do now? He goes, I want to play Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> he's great. He's just on fire, isn't he? Yeah, he's so good. I, it's, 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 uh, loads of people wanted him to come back, didn't they, for years, but because his wife had passed away, he wanted to look after the children and he spent the rest of his life just looking after his kids, you know. I love the, the confidence that um, Janine has in this. Um, I love what she does. Well, she the... seduces him, you know. Yeah. she's Well, she's given more, to, arguably in a way, she's given more to do than... yeah. Than Dana, yeah, you know, um, I, I mentioned about her costume before and this bob haircut that she has. Um, and she's so funny, she only pops, she's so no, funny. yeah, uh, but it's almost I, I, I can't work out. I'm trying to remember where that look came from because I remember, I remember in late 88. May into eighty nine that this kind of Bob style was in, mm. but I've kind of gone back and looked at stuff, and I and I, I you know, it's sort of vaguely like um, Melanie Griffith in uh, something wild, but not because this is this is a red, you know, this is a red headed look, and mm. you know, and um, I, I, Sue's, in the cartoon, you know, but Janine's got this kind of punk kind yeah. of hair, you know. Um, well, it's almost like a caricature of her hair in the in the in the cartoon show yeah um sorry the, the in the cartoon it sort of ca- caricatures that yeah uh, and um you know and it's sort of you know it's it's it, it's not loud like this she's really sort of making a statement with her clothes mm. and you know and her confidence and um i think Susie sue in 1988 kind of had that bob the bob look that kind of mm. louise brooksy look did come back but even the look is kind of it's a bit punky it's a bit mm. 70s almost yeah you know but i just i remember it sort of it seemed to be on the pulse at the time. This, I remember there's a, there's a little a bit of trivia about this sequence where they'd shot this scene because it's freezing cold as well, but either there was no film in the camera or something went wrong with it. They had to redo it again and they were fuming. They were so angry. They had to reshoot this whole sequence. Right. Yeah. And that building is the National Museum of American... Of the American Indian, I think. Mm. I've written that down. Because I remembered it was used in Batman Forever as the Ritz Gotham. Oh, really? Yeah, it's okay. the, same, the same exterior. Well, actually, Batman Forever uses a lot of architecture that is kind of... Well, they went to New York early and they shot... Early yeah. 1900s. They were going for a gothic look, but they, yeah. they went and used actual architecture in New York. And mm. I mean, there's a lot of New York that, that is very old and beautiful, but... Mm. You know, I think if you were to make a film now, a Ghostbusters film, you know, I would, I would just, I would, you know, I'd make a database of all the old, all the stuff that looks old and is old. I think the only thing that you see in here, oh, that's great, isn't it? That gag with the, um, with the slime. I would have anything that's haunted and ghost related be part of the older buildings. You could have modern architecture, but that will be kind of. Where you'd have to have it way in the background. Yeah. No, they wouldn't be prominent. But no. I, but even the beginning of the first film, you've got that you know that that lion, mm. you know, appearing at the statue, and you know, I think you'd have to like you'd have to make the composite New York, the fake New York that you have in in here. I think once you start seeing steel beams and whatever, it takes you out of the haunted house. It takes you out of that haunted house environment. That that, that even this film does really really well. Mm. Uh, Bobby Brown. Yeah, this song. song. Oh, you know what? We should talk about New Jack Swing. New Jack Swing, this music, and there's Bobby Brown. There's his cameo, goes, yeah. No, it's a music video, it's got loads of cameos, isn't it? It's got Trump, it's got, yeah. the best thing about it though, it's got Christopher Reeve in it. It was always, yeah. people always said, that often saw him cycling around New York a lot. I don't think he even got his bike stolen one time, you think he said. Uh, I was, yeah, I was just going to say with, with the song, um, 
On Our Own by Bobby Brown. Bobby Brown was a huge star, absolutely. And I mean, if you weren't alive at that time, you, you it's hard to... What would be the closest thing now? Something like... Um, you can't say R. Kelly. <laughs> Bruno Mars? The, uh, br- yeah, I suppose so. Somebody uh, like... I mean, Bruno Mars has even gone into that new Jack Swing sound. But it was there was a kind of general feeling in the 80s, in the mid-80s, that, um, that R&B had become somewhat commercialised mm. and that, you know, the, the, you know the, 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 the kind of true kind of R&B sound of the street had kind of gone and, mm. and uh, there were people like um, Teddy Riley um, with... with and Keith Sweat, uh, and the, and they were trying to get this melding R and B like a soul sound, but with mm. with hip hop, which really yeah. was you know so to so get a truth to it, yeah. you know, and they were they they kind of linked this these genres together, and um, and New Jack Swing was born, and and um, this was really at the height of it, sort of eighty eight until ninety two ish, yeah. But um, you know, this was produced, the song was produced and written by Babyface in L A. LaFace, um, who'd done, um, they did another, they did tons and tons of other hits they were like almost like the stock Aitken waterman of new jack swing i think <laughs> in some way because they wrote beautiful it's, melodies it's, it's funny because yeah. it, it's got you know it's got hip-hop you know it's got that sort of swing as you were saying new jack swing, new yeah. jack swing. and then a the year later with, with turtles you've got a lot of hip house kind of sound to it yeah um it was everything even in 89 though i mean you on the op- opposite end of that you had new kids on the block you know that sort of sound going down. You know. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing time, it really was. Um, you know, the mayor plays a bigger part in this film. We're just looking at him here, and I was saying before, you know, like with the um, with with the first film, I think sort of retroactively, it's it's um, you know, it's kind of seen as a, a film that's um, well, I think it's arguable. I think you can argue the case either for and against about it being about the you know being in favor of the private sector and and in this film you know as i said you know i mentioned before about the meanness that the that uh reitman and uh you know that right and Ackroyd had felt about new york city you know at this time in much of the in batman as well there was the mayor was um ed koch mm. and um this was coming towards the i mean it's his fight it released this film's released in the final year of you know of, of him being mayor and um he had he's often seen as as being the person who kind of turned the spirit of of new york around the spirit mm. of new york and um and uh I kind of feel that in this film that he has more of a positive um, mm. impact on everything. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. in the first film, there's that bit. I mean, again, I, I, <laughs> I just think it's so dark um, and quite. You know, the bit where, um, at the end um, where he looks at uh, Lenny. You know, mm. and um, and and. Uh, Venkman says, you know, you'll get a, you'll get a load of good votes if you know if you do this. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. You yeah. know, it just yeah. shows sort it's of all like about power he wants, isn't it? Um, and popularity. This scene is though, it's unfortunate that it, it is basically just a complete copy of the first one, the first. Yeah, movie. yeah, yeah. And you know, with him, the guy, the, the mayor's Kurt assistant, Kurt Fuller is well, basically yeah. filling in the void of. Uh, the, Willie Matherton, yeah. Yeah. So, it's, sorry, no. What's his face? Is like, that his name, Willie Matherton? I can't remember now. Is it? Yeah. I, mean, I think people know who we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then he has some committed. It was great that you got a great cameo of Bill Murray's brother. Yeah. And he's just like, tell us more about this slime. And he's just and then Bill Murray just tells him just the truth, just but in a very just like ugh, fed up kind of way, you know. But it's you know the Mary seems a positive character. You see him as well, and the morale of the people as well. In mm. you know New York, in uh, Times Square, mm. uh, sorry, in uh, outside the square of the um, the the. The art museum at the mm-hmm. end, you know, sort of gathering everyone, and you see them going and having the key, you know, the key. So it's a very sort of different, um, you know, a different. It ties spin. into, as you were saying earlier, I think it's sort of a clean slate at the end, and, and the, yeah. the urban decay where the the mayor at the time had cleaned up New York, and that, that's what they, and it ends quite well. well with, yeah, that, yeah, and it ends eighty nine ends with a, a fresh yeah, start yeah. for the next decade. But also too, I'll add that um, in the make in the novelization of Ghostbusters, apparently. Um, oh, this th- th- film, sorry. Yeah, this Ghostbusters oh, yeah. Two, sorry. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Yeah. On Ghostbusters Two novelization, um, the mayor is actually he's actually named as Mayor Clotchy. Oh right. Or I think it's Clotchy. Yeah. So it's you know, well, if yeah, you think yeah. of, you know, this stuff is all there for a reason. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that. They, and again, you know, Batman and Ghostbusters Two, they are not documentaries about what, no. what was happening at the time. No. But every film, no matter how fantastical you think it is, 
it, writers are very, writers are very sophisticated on all films, and they want to tap into what's happening now. And you know, even if it's subtle, even if you don't it's, see it's it, it's always subtle. Generally, you know. they don't they don't usually. As you're talking about business in the first one, both first Ghostbusters, it's not bashing you over the head about business. No. It's, it's unless it's you're alive the, to it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it's just there as a sort of means to tell this story to get the Ghostbusters moving forward. Um, but there's always stuff there. And that idea of, you know, basically getting a mortgage on a house, you know, on your own property. Get like, he goes, everyone has three mortgages nowadays, whatever he says, you know. Um, and when, what's this, David Margulies, who plays the mayor when he died, um, you know, lots of people did say that he was basically playing Koch in Ghost. Ah. So there's an acknowledgement of that too, you know. So these things kind of all bump and... She, weird here, the makeup they've on Sigourney, they make her look so pale, don't they? Yeah, it might, it might just be the color design. It might just be the telecine job on this, the, the color grading. Um, I, I do sometimes wonder if Oliver has has maybe sleepwalked into here and you know messed around with the calibration on his um, <laughs> his television. Hey, mate, my my four K TV is calibrated perfectly. I must say, I'm all, like fussy bastard, all your retrospection reviews, they're all perfectly calibrated. <laughs> this is a this is a great scene. This is a great, great, great. Great, 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 great scene. It, this scared me as a kid. Yes, yeah, this, this is terrifying. With the, the sort of the old, the Victorian nanny. Yeah. Janos. And uh, this, the way he looks at his eyes go, his arms go, his arms go, brrr, just extends, that weird sound effect it makes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but also, you know, what I mentioned before and what we've said about the, the whole Victorian imagery thing too. Mm, yeah. Um, and, and it's I'm, just inherently creepy. I don't know yeah. why. You well, know. you've got, you know, we're, we're in a franchise where you never see any young people and all of a sudden you've got a baby standing on a ledge on the side of a building. God, yeah. You know, which I think is every parent's nightmare. Oh, God. Um, you know, and, and then you've got this kind of Victorian version of um, Janosch coming down. I actually didn't realise for years that it was him. So, and I th so I just thought there's this scary grandma coming down. Really? You didn't know? Yeah. Oh my God, that's weird. And this is a matte painting but by But that's, that's another kind of bending the rules of Ghostbusters because he's, he turns Janos into yeah, a ghost. Yeah, the internal logic doesn't work. Yeah, it no. doesn't work here really. It's just that they just thought, this is fucking creepy. Let's do it. Let's have Janos do it. And I didn't think about the kind of rules of that. Um, it's still, yeah. It's, it's still a great visual. The little visual. kid's face looks terrified. <laughs> it does look a bit like Dougal from Father Ted, really. Mm. <laughs> you're oh, right. I love saying mass. That's you're right. You're right about that hand. It's just yeah. terrifying. This is just great. And the little bling at the end makes it even worse because yeah. it's a childlike sound. Yeah. It also just reminds me of the cartoon a little bit. But I love it. Is that little electric drums when do 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 do? Yeah. They that yeah. kind of makes it sound like a Jerry Goldsmith action score from 1980. Don't Six insult Goldsmith, how dare you? Well, I'm thinking of something... <laughs> Get out! <laughs> I'm thinking... He, well, he won an Oscar nomination for that film with Gene... Uh, was it called... I forget what it's called. Who's just the uh, Gene Hackman film about basketball? Oh, God, I don't remember that. And it's all kind of this... It's In fact, I think they had the sound of basketballs being bashed on a hall. Anyway, that's not Ghostbusters. <laughs> they go like... That was <laughs> fake, but it's completely fed up. He just like, oh, these guys are completely nuts. Because <laughs> he's, you know, he, Bill Murray's brothers popped up in uh, Caddyshack, yeah, uh, and Groundhog Day. I don't know what other ones he popped in, popped up in. Um, That's terrible. I mean, just look at that. Look at yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bubbling up now. It's gonna, yeah, that uh, uh, just comes out. I mean, the, this uh, is where we're talking about the photographic look of the film. Now it gets interesting. Yeah, yeah. Once it now gets, it looks once great. It, once it becomes night night yeah. time, it becomes interesting to look at. I think that's another reason about the kind of what we we're saying about that beige look that I think maybe it's because there are so many scenes set against open windows during winter, huge yeah. bay windows during winter. So you've got mm. overcast skies bleeding all that light in and it, you know, it's just, there's only one way to go. This looks gorgeous. All this is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, Michael Chapman's an amazing cinematographer. He shot Raging Bull, he shot Taxi Driver. <laughs> Taxi, yeah. Oh yeah, Taxi Driver's a great looking movie. All of And that's got a very smoky look to it and it's all very kind of like gritty, the, the and, gritty and stuff. Real yeah. New York. Well, I mean, you know, they had all of the Ghostbusters films have had amazing cinematographers. Some of the, you know, work with some of the biggest films. Well, even the, the new one had a great the yeah, DP Robert who Young. worked with Wes Anderson. Yes, it, exactly. The yeah. Life Aquatic was a stunning movie. Yeah. This is quite terrifying. All this stuff with uh, it's kind of yeah, it's, it's weird ritual where all the candles are all laid out. Which we kind of saw some of the candles earlier, but it's kind of when you've got a child in the middle. In the middle, it, it also visualizes a sacrifice. 
And look at the red. That's obviously, the yeah. slime's now come down. Well, this is where my colour uh, production design theory, I think, really comes into play because mm. you, in a moment we're going to see statues. Is it, we say sort of the green's good and the, and the red is bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this little moment here because he's like, hello, Dana, you know. Because it's kind of like it's him again, you know, in some way that he's not possessed, but I don't know. It'd be interesting to sort of see that like Vigo's assistant from the past has now embodied Janos. Hmm. Um, kind of like his jester or something, I don't know. He's kind of Otis <laughs> to, to Lex Luthor. Is it, this is the bit with the snaking vacuum cleaner. Where is, no, sorry, this is where she... Yeah, because I said earlier where she gets thrown back. Yeah, she Later on, she attempts to... But go along with go. the plan, yeah. but there, yeah, that's when she gets pulled back. Sorry, yes, but it's yeah. separate from her child. That's when point. she, yeah, when he's going through the ritual, he, she takes the baby and he's like, Argh. I didn't notice the prominent Winnie the Pooh yeah. thing there. That's cute. That's a great shot there. Look at the detail yeah. on that. It's also reversed upside down. Mm hmm. And this is. Um, I like this. I like this track here. Who sings? Is this Glenn Frey? Yeah, I think so. I also want to see the movies on the side. I don't know. What, I think they're just kind of made-up ones. I think. No, this one, the, the top, the Cannibals one. That's yeah. um, that's Ivan Reitman's one of Ivan Reitman's earlier films. Oh right. This stuff is horrible. I mean, all this stuff with people, things coming back from the dead. Mm. You know. Well, other little with uh, Cheech Marin. At, yeah. the, uh, at the docks. I mean, that's just so morbid, isn't it? <laughs> but late than never. <laughs> it's so morbid. The sounds of the. Beast. You know, on, on the first film they had, uh, there's a creature people, Steve Johnson, who went on to do, um, on the first film, doing, uh, who went on to do... This is a kind of, sorry, it's a shot similar to uh, yeah. Marshmallow Man, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And spe spe Steve Johnson went on to do Species on the first film, and Randy, oh, C Randy yeah. Cook, who ended up doing The Gollum on Lord of the mm. Rings. And, you know, on this film they had... Um, uh, they had the ILM Creature Shop, mm. um, and one of the animators they had was David Allen, who'd done Davy and Goliath in the 60s and had done lots of ILM movies and done and won an Oscar nomination for Sherlock Holmes as well. Wow. Young Sherlock Holmes. Oh, yeah, the Titanic. Nah, this is quite shot. Still yeah. creeps me out. I mean, they're real people, you know. I mean, yeah, and you've got the sound of the. The, um, the thing is, though, when you. Is it Foghorn or whatever, you know? It does kind of open it up a bit in terms of taste. Um, I mean, there's a huge amount of bad taste in the Ghostbusters films too. And <laughs> so, I mean, no, but I mean, you know, within our lifetime, you know, somebody could be doing a joke of, you know, 9-11, mm. you know. Um, oh, was that chap? He was like the, one of the teachers in, he's in loads of stuff. He's in Ferris Bueller, he's in The Mask. He just goes, Bueller, Bueller, mm. you know, in class. But I wonder, just on that point, do you think, do you think there needs to be a passing of time before you can do jokes about? Uh, it's usually about twenty years, generally. I think maybe a decade. It's I think South Park. Thing South, Park about. South Park had talked had, had mentioned that when things were then officially funny. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to go down that route. No, absolutely not. <laughs> But it was something at the time as a child watching it. I did think this is a real event, the Titanic. It wasn't, it wasn't that made-up railroad thing, which you have some distance with. And there yeah. was talk of the Titanic at the time in the 80s. Yes, because they had discovered it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was, like a, it was a new thing. It was, a, it was, was on the pulse. 88, 86, yeah. something like that? They're... And originally, apparently, ILM have shown sketches that they wanted to do the Hindenburg. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's it just... sort of finally arrives in New York, you know, just kind of... Well, something like that. that. Something like that, yeah. This is a great shot here. It's a cloud a tank shot. Yeah, it? it's one of your favourite little things, isn't it? To talk about cloud tanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very. Star Trek Two's got a lot of great. This cloud whole tank this stuff. whole montage is basically a recreation of the. Yeah. I believe it's magic sequence. Yeah, it is. Yeah, doesn't quite doesn't doesn't work as well, but it's that's a you know it's a great it's visual beat effect. Beat for beat, the same. Yeah, thing. that's that was the problem, wasn't it? People had with it was that it's just beat for beat the same, you know. I mentioned to you before, but on the DVD release of this initially, on Ghostbusters 1, on the menu screen, it had a map of New York with Stay Puff marching, marching around it. Yeah. And on the sequel one, they took out Stay Puff and they put the Statue of Liberty and had that marching around. Yeah. And it doesn't help the argument that I think is common that this is a, just a retread of, the, of yeah. the first film, unfortunately. 
The artistry well, here is like the Rocky films are just a retread of each. Each oh week. yeah, Sequels yeah, yeah. Is kind of the same. This is hard thing. stuff to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh look, green and red again <laughs> on the top of the and more green and red, green and red. Also, it plays the green and red play into the the, the primary colours of Christmas. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, it all links together. You know. He's a brilliant designer, Bo Welch. Really good. And you can see that in all of his films. Didn't Bo, used... didn't Bo Welch do do a Star Wars film? No, you're thinking of Rick Heinrichs. That's it. Yeah, Yeah. he did Last Jedi, didn't he? Yeah, correct. That's amazing visual effect. There's also another deleted scene where you see the mayor's assistant kind of get sucked up into the, into the, the, the slime shield. Doesn't he? And his shoes just go. Rup, 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 I wonder away. that in that deleted scene, yeah, where where Kurt Fuller does get consumed mm. by the uh, by the by the blob, because it does does he sur- would the intention for him to to, to survive would it be to survive? You know, because yeah, well, I suppose he would survive when it all kind of breaks up and he's kind of just stuck in it, maybe like that, like that, uh, like goo. But because in the what, end what we've seen though yeah. throughout those deleted scenes on the blu rays that they've. Basic, they're just different alternative takes of scenes that are in the film, or they've just re- restructured some of it slightly. It's not like we're seeing this. Well, there's a couple of scenes which are just like that's been cut completely because it was just done for pacing issues and time. They need to keep to a certain amount of time. This film's an hour 48, roughly. It's not a two hour movie, just shy of it. Um, and and I think, yeah, it's, it's clear that they're doing the filming. They're like, no, this is not working. Let's let's ha- let's have this character survive. Let's have this scene set outside instead of inside. You know. I think Edelsman's music comes mm-hmm. together here. Mm-hmm. You know, this film. Uh, I, you know, I, I think we've been. You know, we've we've been quite objective with it. Yeah. So far, you yeah. know, and we've really praised the good things in it, but I do think it is a slow burn, mm. and it's and and the stuff that's great in it's so good. Yeah. It's so so good, and you know, it's great to finally get to this bit where they just, even the pacing, you know, everything mm. sort of picks up and it's really going, and you can feel it going. No, oh, I love this. I love the music. <laughs> so uplifting. my favorite cue is when they jump into the uh, museum i mean here great heroic march right now ray is doing his rant talking about how mean-spirited the city's become and talking about the spirit of it you know and trying to find positive inspiration and mm. going because yeah, to- ray's the heart of the ghostbusters he's the one who's going to encourage the others it will always be that i love the way this Character. is directed look at this see this is a beautiful for all the mm. exposition in the film yeah you know, and yeah, expository dumps, as you said, just look at this for a visual moment. And the music, so uplifting, so positive. Yeah. You know, when, you, when it cuts to that shot, yeah. them looking up. Well, and this shot here, just going in, because you think, oh, you know, so beautiful. Listen, it? it's rousing, isn't mm. it? This is so good in its own way. It's not Elmer Bernstein, but it's great in its own way. This is a miniature shot and a map painting. Sort it's beautiful, of isn't it? It's yeah. Really, really well done. The other thing... Even that shot there, they, they haven't lost any colour. None of this is actually shot in, uh, you know... On Liberty Island. None of it. No. Apart from at the end when they have that aerial shot. Yeah. That would have be, been done in one day. Yeah. Get this done well, morning. Quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Crack, crack, the tourists are coming. But this is all done with visual effects. And, mm. you know, it's kind of like with when we've talked about Superman and Batman and how they're shot in Britain, mm. but, you know, they have to look like America. And before you even see anything great happen, mm. they have to convince you that you're in... You know, yeah, well, that's the same production design. This is what they're doing here. You know, yeah. a lot of it is LA, which they're trying to make look like, you know, so even at the... Be- you know, before you even look at the ghosts, you're, go- you're believing New York is real. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I think the design of these guns is quite interesting. Yeah, I quite like that. I mean, it's it's... Also, they've actually put them back in the original outfits as well, which is cool. I like them, you know, just in the normal sort of greyish outfit or the beige outfit. There's a great motion control shot coming up here too, where you see in the crown of the Ghostbusters. See here, yeah. the Ghostbusters, the crown of it, that's actors on a set, filmed on a computer-controlled camera that pulls backwards. Then they repeat that movement on a motion control stage with a miniature of the Statue of Liberty, so it marries the two together, so it looks like they're actually in 
you know that's incredible isn't it? and i love this this is so good this, <laughs> it's because all inanimate stuff it's so it's creepy but it's like upbeat music and you think what the f- what's going on you know <laughs> and the thing that you don't expect i think that really puts a lump in my throat and just makes it sincere and pure and positive is the explosion of the torch yeah you know because you know it's going to walk you know it's going to get up but you just and it's such a big huge look in the sound and everything just go it re- i mean i so love uplifting. i love the moment my the best most the, the sort of uh you know it puts a lump puts a, puts a lump in your throat it's when the such liberty just goes back and swings in and smashes yeah, the yeah, roof yeah because everyone just sort of goes with it they yeah, sort of yeah, you know yeah. cheer this is if you look here they've just had triumphant music and then it stops and they just hear the silence it's just sp- fending itself but if you hear the sound of the feet slapping the feet yeah seabed underneath you hear like a bend a metal Boomf. bending you know it's like boom you get a sense of sense of scale and mm. it is just so bizarre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a great shot. And this is all very tender. Oh, she's too. Got, he's got yeah, he's wearing Spengler's outfit. And it's great for Tully because, um, you know, we're putting behind the geek who got, you know, the, the, this nerd character that gets that mm. is alienated and gets locked out of his own party in the first film and everything. And, you know, he's starting his own, you know, life as a, you know... I remember on the back of the VHS oh, tape I had yeah. this shot with running out. I was like, who is this Ghostbuster? The punchline as well. <laughs> <laughs> Reitman's just such a master at shooting this. Oh, this this is great. Oh, I've got a real thing for crowd scenes of cities and visual yeah. effects. It just, oh, this is just perfectly done. Mm. Absolutely magnificently done. Oh, that shot, the wide. Yeah. And even the Howard Huntsbury track is mm. great. And just seeing shots of people being positive, you know, this energy, you know. When was the last time you saw in a film people cheering in the streets at their heroes, you know? God, yeah. It's, and it's, it's such a great moment in this film because the ghost was being down in the dirt. I mean, you know, in many ways, this film works really, really well because once you get to this point, you are... I mean, I defy anyone to say that they're not just inspired and loving this end bit, but at the beginning, it is a slow burn to get there. It's quite depressive and depressing and Trump Tower <laughs> right in the middle. And that's probably... I mean, he was very, uh, you know, he was in t- very in touch with Hollywood. You know, he was in the Home Alone sequels and whatnot, Trump. Yeah, um, right. And, you know, he probably helped them out getting the permit to <laughs> film, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know. That, great, that's, that's one of my favourite great effect visual effect yeah. in the film because it's a real police car and right at the last few frames they then it's a miniature yeah, yeah. they put a miniature it, it, just, it just blends oh, I love this, this line make good decisions I love that <laughs> so good, good. make good decisions <laughs> I love when people are saying just dumb stuff uh, like it's coming just, out of their mouth naturally we see but it sounds so written down like, yeah oh it's you and he goes <laughs> it's like a cat it grunts like a cat yeah you had your license. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of taking it into a bit of a batty extreme with the uh, party hats too. Tone, there's a tone thing here yeah. that's kind of crossed, but oddly it works. And it's, yeah, you see this sort of the cross dissolve into Vigo's face. Well, this yeah. is this is another. I don't want to be a downer. I really don't want to be a downer with this beautiful positive moment. But the other big problem with you the notice film, that when a slime begins to disappear. Yeah, yeah, that's really clever. It's beautiful, it? yeah. All analog optical visual effects. It's just this moment here. I love this bit. I mean, the music and just seeing it all, all going cue. My big problem. Oh look! Look at the green. Look at look. They've really gone with it. They've put it in the cinematography and they've put it in the cinematography look here as well. You know, you've got it. It's green light, green versus red. You know, they've really, really, really gone for it here. But my problem with the villain compared to the first one. In the film, first one, you really got a sense when. Um, uh, the bad guy goes there. Yeah. That whole thing at the end with the sky opening up and whatnot. Mm. And, you know, it really feels like the end of the world's coming. Yeah. Whereas in here, it's, I'm going to take over the body of a baby. Yeah. And? And what's he going to do? What's, it's you know... A, it's just going to be a child. He's got to wait till he gets older till he can actually, ha- you know, take over the world. And you know, it, there's a... His it, plan is not particularly interesting. No, but it doesn't, it doesn't really, really make sense as well. It's it? like it's like where do you go once you've got yeah. that river of slime has come? The river of slime has come to, you know, this epicenter of you know this 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 art gallery, but 
where does it go from there? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think I don't think they, they even knew really because his master plan isn't particularly deep. It's, there isn't there isn't a sort of you're not given this this long uh, this kind of plan to think far ahead. It's all very short term plan, um, and it's just there to sort of set up the villain. And I think. He's an interesting villain, but with a very kind of bland plan. But I think the build-up of him is brilliant. But it's just the mm. outcome is just not very good. I think that's the main problem with the film because in the in the first film, as we said, it was this one-off thing where this portal opens because someone's been silly down in in Earth, yeah. you know. Um, and then you know they the Ghostbusters they 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 I mean the whole thing with the first film is they're monetizing the end unknowingly monetizing the end of the world you know yeah. which I don't think is a very good argument for capitalism but you know but whereas in here you know and it's funny and it's it's dark humor but it's also like there's a there, that you know there's 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 a point to it at the end and there's things at stake and at here there's nothing really at stake mm. at all. His whole introduction here is it's very. Blair, yeah. you know, he should have had him walk out the painting. He's also it just, it just, it just kind of optically fades in, you know. It's just there's also uninspired. so much, so much power in that painting. Unfortunately, mm. that I think as soon as he comes out of the painting, it's he's not yeah, scary anymore. No, no. And it's and it's that was they have this little battle here with him, and then he you know he picks up Oscar, and the, here's your the, the public outside chanting that sort of weakens him, and then he drops the child. Vegan gets there in time, and then they slime him. You know, there's a, you get the little moment where Vigo takes over Ray, which is quite a cool moment. Where he just turns around and goes, yeah. "I Vigo will rule the earth." He goes now and just slimes him, and um, that's a you know, kind of interesting moment. But it's a bit of a lackluster face-off. You know, it's it, it, all this moment here is just it's zapped all the well, the drama out of it really for me. The, the sort of tension. Well, Sigourney Weaver's waist is wrapped round with the vacuum. And he's and she's he's just picking up Oscar in a sort of bland corner of the museum. Yeah, the it's least just, visually interesting. Yeah, it's so un, so uninteresting. You know, because when you see in the first one, you've got this this poor window into another world. Which yeah, this weird that glass really pyramid. Really throws your imagination. As yeah, well, yeah. Know. It's just this is just you know. I don't think also. It, I don't it, think he it, he doesn't look like the ILM visual effect that we see mm, at all. No. From what I remember, they used a prosthetic on the nose for the painting. You're right. Figure. And Wilhelm von Homburg, I forget his real name. I think it's Norbert Guppe. I think I can't remember. Possibly, yeah. Anyway, he he was a very good looking boxer. You know, he was. Um, you know, he wasn't. He wasn't the kind of old demonic sorcerer character mm. and so here that you know they call him a bimbo at one point mm. you know peter he's, just he's been, bimbo with the baby yeah, yeah but it doesn't i don't know what the intention is because he just looks he kind of looks young the hair the hair actually does look bimboish mm. it looks too clean it doesn't look like this guy who's been on mountains of skulls and yeah you know it doesn't really it quite looks longer his hair's longer it looks yeah. more like a mullet in the other one you know a little bit yeah um but he looks grizzled and you know yeah and you don't get any... He's been through war, yeah. you know. Uh, but that's just my, you know... Yeah, it's it's just... I, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great build-up to this this finale, which is ultimately a bit uninspired, a bit blandly shot, I think. Uh, I just really wanted more from this, this confrontation at the end. I think the question is, as well, where do you go once you've got that kind of, you know, the encrusted building with all the... Mm purple stuff over yeah. the top of it where do you go from there wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't have vigo had like demons and uh, guardians inside the museum to stop the ghostbusters they jump in they all artifacts are they there artifacts yeah they come be... out the wall and try and attack them you should have extended the the fight scene or they go into the painting yeah oh oh, oh man you, they walk into the painting go to this other dimension that's a good shot when you got the is it cg stuff isn't it with the, the it's faces. not cg it's, it's not cg all... wasn't it I can't remember how I did that. I think it's, I don't know, optical trickery. Yeah. I mean, this is very good how they set up all this stuff with Ray. Mm. It's got horns coming out. Now. Yeah, I mean, that sort of takes it away too because mm. there's something, there's so much, as I said before, like with the opening shot and the, um, the pram, mm. when you don't, like, you think, and human figures and things, that's a lot scarier than a demon with a horn. Yeah, yeah. Because a demon horn is just a... Could be... A, there's no story to it. There's no, you know... 
there's a mystery to not knowing about things. I mean, in in um, you know, I mentioned about Insidious before, but that mm. old wit, you know, the old woman in Insidious, you you don't know the motivation and you're kind of terrified mm. by, you know, mm. the fear of the unknown, you know, that yeah. it's just a really universal thing. And once you kind of make a demon that's specified and you can kind of see it, it sort of takes it away. That would have been crazy though, if they went to another portal, another dimension through that painting. That would have been just because you've had everything played out so kind of, yeah. you know, uh, kind of normalised with Ghostbusters universe. But going into this other world would have been bonkers. Yeah, yeah. that would have been great. It would have been cost a fortune though. Well, we've got a nice up tempo, uh, upbeat moment at the end now, hmm. which is quite. That's good. a kind of that's I've seen that shot so many times, like Presti or something. Like yeah, that, or something then together. <laughs> just to get out of the way. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> I've had a couple of drunk mates like that. They <laughs> get a bit too friendly. <laughs> you know, this whole thing with the painting, as we said at the end, you know, just keeping with the, the thematic element that the, you know, it's. Wait, will it be? Yeah, I think at this point it is nineteen ninety in the in the film, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's now. It'll be now nineteen ninety. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's like clean slate, you know, yeah. moving forward, and it was all supposed to happen on midnight, wasn't it? So, and I consider this canon totally. This film, for all the problems that I have, you know, I know it's sort of seen by the fans as being cut off, and you know, mm. at times it's seen in a very negative light. I think there's loads of great things in this film. Oh yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't. I don't. I, I, I consider it canon, completely canon. I don't, I don't see it as yeah. a the black sheep of this kind of very kind of small series, really. Yeah. That was never meant to be a series. No, no. So it no. had a really tough job. This is an amazing end title sequence, though. Look at that. That's a great shot. It's such a shame they didn't use the music more often. I love that. I fucking love that theme. And it's. I love how. I, I I love it when movies do this, where it has the actor and tells you their rule, you know, tells you their their name, and it's like a little outtake or a sort of right. a deleted scene. It's not it's done like, anymore, really. No, is it? so it is. It's very much comes from sitcom. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's how I love. Well, the, even Predator does it though. That's an action sci-fi movie. I love the cut to the Bobby Brown track. Mm. And on beat, you know, he raises his eyebrows. Yeah, I very yeah. Much love that. And this is a great shot of that's Rick kind of like that's is that a delete it's the delete scene. This yeah, should have been in be. the film. Yeah, this is great. It's just look, Ro, I, <laughs> I love how it goes. Ivan that. Reitman is such a gifted physical, yeah, yeah, comedy filmmaker. Ernie Hudson is great in this too. He's, we haven't said anything no, about. No, it. it's fucking good, good old Ernie. I mean, actually, I, oh, I made I mean, a note, mental note in my head to sort of say because how the characters were introduced at the beginning. Ernie had there's no discussion about what Ernie was up to his character Winston was up to what was his job within those five years he can't just be going and do birthday parties you know um, David Margulies but then you know Ernie gets a short shrift to the whole thing Ghostbusters really he's just there as this extra voice to sort yeah. of have some I don't know, play things down to reality because he's just there really when he goes with the mayor to say look it's just this sludge that's come up you know it's made it's bad vibes you know that's it I mean it's a shame, really, because he's such a great actor. The other thing I'm going to ask you, too, just about the mythology of, of, of this, uh, well, the, you know, and the rules of this franchise and whatnot. Do we think the Ghostbusters are still trading after this film? Or is it is it just a complete repeat of the, of the first in that they defeated that bad guy? That bad guy was basically spook central mm. in the original film. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Vigo. Vigo basically is a spook central type, you know, and he's been defeated and um, and, and now they'll cease to trick because there's no need for them because there's going to be no ghosts anywhere. Or do you think it's kept open? Do you think they all go back to doing parties and whatnot? Or do you think they all, they you know, Venkman goes off and has a family with Dana? I, and- I think Venkman would go off and have a family with Dana. I think there would be, there, there would be less fallout of them be having bad vibes they'll be treated with respect now but would there, they, would there be supernatural activity in new york after this film well after vigo's gone well you know it's hard to say because there's never a third film you know but i it's judging by how it's finished 
it sh- it's it's kind of put then put the lid on it again. So it's case. So you say it's, it's case, case closed. closed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that is a rule of the of the franchise, really. Really, yeah. To a degree, they, they they reluctantly come back for another one because people really want it, and the filmmakers yeah. don't want to do it. I'm interested in the new one. If if they if it's another thing where like Vigo and with Spook Central, there is a portal that mm. opens. Yeah. And then ghosts start coming out the portal, mm. and then you know. The Ghostbusters then are in business. Yeah. They go and they defeat that. Mm. You know, the portal closes. Yeah. And then they're out of business again. Is <laughs> that, is that you know, is that the pattern with it? You know, because... Well, because just, how, how films are written today, how they're constructed, Dave, studios always want there to be a, a door open for sequels. So the film would... I, I, how I would want it would be, it does kind of put a lid on it, but then the post credit kind of sequence would have this kind of window that there could be something else happening. That'll be it. It's just because on the TV show, every week it would be like there would be a, there would, it would be rent, you know, rent the Ghostbusters, they come out and it's yeah. just, it's just sort of within that universe, within the world, there are ghosts populating yeah. New York, just, yeah. and just New York. Or yeah. actually in the cartoon, there was other places beyond New they York. They would go, too. yeah, they would travel, yeah. Yeah, so, but, but whereas this is, it's a one off thing, it's just a one off. I think it should go beyond New York for the next one. They should be like, I don't know, like go up to um, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> just go up like a little bit a bit north they go you know, to Dubai or whatever you know just something just so it, goes, it steps out of New York for a bit sure to show there is some sort of expanse you know to it all but um, yeah I'm intrigued to see what they're going to do with it I'm not going to some of my my audience have, have asked me what I thought of this sort of the news of this new Ghostbusters film I was just like look I'm not going to I'm not going to be angry about anything I'm not going to be overly enthusiastic about anything at all till I actually see some footage and actually really see the whole film as a whole because I've been burnt so many times before or been so enthusiastic about something and just being gutted. Um, that's a good song. I like this song. Yeah. This this is interesting, this song. You know, I mentioned about Nude Jack Swing and Bobby Brown. Mm. Um, so I think he, he produced this song and he got a writing credit on this one, but nobody remembers it. That sounds like the song The Hedgehog. Yeah. Well... This that 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 is called what's it called? March of Entrance of the Gladiators, that right. sample. And lots of new Jack Swing songs at that time, like mm. I think Merry Go Round, I think by Guy, and I think I think Keith Sweat had a a song as well, but they all kind of used that. This sounds like a hedgehog to me. And this is the uh Run DMC. Really. I wasn't a fan of the Run DMC one that much. I like Run DMC, but the Ghostbusters tracks are yeah, it's. It, I I thought the soundtrack album release of the first film was so much better. Yeah, I love the track Magic. I think it's brilliant. It works so well. And you got the other uh, the track when they come out of the Ghostbusters headquarters to go track fight fight Slimer for the first time. Um, yeah, I just thought it kind of worked. There's, there's more tracks on it which I kind of you know had more nostalgia for. But. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I still really want the um, the complete score to this film uh, by Rand, uh, by yeah, Randy me too. That would be great. Yeah. Um, hopefully, you know they'll they'll put it out soon. And maybe this year we'll get something interesting. Flesh and Blood by Danny Elfman, Ongo Bongo. Yeah, what track? Where was that played? I have no idea. I know the track, and I my mind gone black. I don't recall that being played. How bizarre! Yeah, because none of the composer's work was on the soundtrack release. It's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Completely ignored. Just on uh, quickly, one thing I didn't mention about New York, just quickly at, right at the end. There's a, I think it's the New York Times. There's an article that I'd found that I was reading about about Batman and about this. It mentions Batman, this, and it mentions do the right thing, and it's and just about urban decay and about where New York was at at a time. It said that it was interesting that all these three films, they're all very different, even Ghostbusters and Batman, mm. you know, kind of different, but Ghostbusters 2, Batman, Do the Right Thing, it said that, it's, it's just to sign off on the article, it, it said it, in all three of the films, it shows New York as mortal. Oh, right. You know, New York can be mortal and New York is mortal. And I, yeah, I think that's play, you know, especially with Ghostbusters 2. I think it mentions yeah. Ghostbusters 2 more than all the others, but that's a, that's a really interesting article to read too. Sorry, I just I should have mentioned that much, <laughs> much earlier. Um, I mean, there's loads of great, you know, there's loads of great stuff in this film and I'm a big fan of all of the, the filmmakers that I, were involved with it and it's so hard to make a film and yeah. to make a big, self-contained, amazing hit like Ghostbusters that you want to... 
you know, you want to keep it alive. You want people to be working. You want to have a great industry, mm. you know, and everyone wants a hit and behind it. And I hope, you know, that you, you see that we love Ghostbusters 2 as much as we, we you know, we, we love it as much as we dislike it or we dislike <laughs> yeah, it as yeah. much as we love it or whatever. You know, we, we have that relationship and it's a film that we both grew up on, that we both yeah. have great affection for. Mm. You know, I think that's fair, isn't well, it? I think that's very fair, Tim. I, as as we pointed out, it's, it is a slow burn. Once it gets its once it gets its momentum, the third act I think is brilliant. It's just unfortunate the third act has a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a weak finale with Vigo. But hey, you know it's you know it's, it's hindsight now we can sort of point out some of its flaws and what it could have improved upon. But and are we going to watch this in the future? Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, it's a perfect way to end it, Tim. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the commentary. I will be back with some more very soon. Okay, everyone, take care and goodbye. Bye. <laughs>